Okay, call to order the Committee of the Whole meeting for <coughs> Tuesday, January 14th, 2020. Uh, first item agenda is, is roll call. Miller? Here. Rosado? Here. Beck? Here. Knopp? Here. Chancet? Here. Barron? Here. Wolf? Here. O'Brien? Here. Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Okay, we have 14 of 14. Um, second on the agenda is a reminder to please speak into the microphone for BATV and so that everybody in the room can hear. Uh, next up would be approval of the minutes from August 13th, 2019, December 3rd of 2019, and December 10th of 2019. So moved. Second. Motion by Chanzit, second by Knopp. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next up would be items to be removed, added, or changed. Um, per an email earlier this week, uh, we are going to remove the consent agenda in total. All three items, we'll move those to uh, the COW meeting on January 28th. And so if anybody has any questions, make sure that we get them into staff before that meeting so that way we can hopefully get enough information out so that way we can answer all those questions by the time we get to that meeting. I'll try. Okay. Um, next up would be uh, number seven, approval of a Class D1 liquor license application for Brinker Restaurant Corporation doing business as Chili's Bar and Grill. Um, yeah, Your Honor, the, uh, the police, the Petunia Police Department has conducted a background uh, check and investigation uh, <coughs> regarding uh, a change in ownership uh, for Brinker Restaurant Corporation. Uh, that's the, the Chili's out on Randall Road. Um, and they are recommending um, approval. They didn't see any reason um, to not uh, do a changeover of, of that license. And Chief is here if we have any questions. Otherwise, I would move for approval of issuing this new uh, liquor license for Brinker. Second. Motion and second. Any additional <coughs> discussion? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Approved. Um, consent? Yeah. Sure. And you want to take the next one, number eight? We'll come back and do number five. I'm sorry, I skipped over the matters for the public. We do have a couple people here tonight. Oh, yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll get those right after this one. Uh, we created Class K uh, liquor license for the Park District. Uh, this, uh, the restrictions that we had discussed before um, it meant that only certain locations could actually apply for a liquor license. Uh, the lodge, the community center, uh, the civic center, Peg Bond Center, and the depot museum. Uh, the police department has conducted an investigation and a background check and found no reason uh, not to issue this license. So I would also move that we approve the Class K liquor license for the park district. Second. Motion second. Any additional discussion? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, consent. Thank okay. You. Now we will move back to number five for matters from the public. Anybody that wishes to speak could come up to the podium. For things not on the agenda. Right, right. for things not on the agenda. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Marconi Popiel, and I had the honor of speaking with you all a couple months ago about an event that we started to form for the CASA, um, the CASA group. Um, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate, and they advocate for children who end up in the system because they have been abused or neglected. Um, in that time, I've partnered with a lot of people from the different arms of the city. We've come up with a wonderful um, promotion during the month of April, which is Child, Prevent, Ab Child Abuse Awareness Month. And Alan here has partnered with me and is helping me put this all together, as well as all the arms of the city. And I'm going to let Alan do the presentation now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, just, uh, just want to update you on the events that we have planned for the month of April. Um, uh, first off is a uh, soft launch on April 4th that will be, um, and by the way, you should have handouts uh, with all this information on it. So um, that event will be an art luggage event in which uh, in 10, 10 retailers uh, and, and possibly restaurants across the uh, downtown area will display um, art luggage uh, in their windows, and this will be to promote the, um, the CASA event that, that we'll be uh, supporting for that <laughs> month. Uh, the significance of the, the art, the, the luggage is it's, it's 
building on a program that uh, that CASA has when the children are, you know, often when they're taken from the homes or uh, the situations that they're in, they're taken out out of the homes with just the clothes on their back. And so CASA has, you know, a luggage program and basically, you know, each of these children are provided with a luggage, a duffel bag with essential items that they need. Um, so as they're as they're going through this, so that's the significance of the luggage. And so, the as I said, there'll be um, we have artists uh, from the high school and local artists who are uh, working on uh, painting luggage pieces for us that will be uh, displayed in these businesses. And then on April fourth, um, you know, there we'll have the, an event where individuals can um, from the community can go to and visit the um, different retail locations. And, and and find out more information about CASA and what they do. Um, and uh, also, you know, we're going to do a bit of a, a, um, a giveaway where if someone goes to all 10 locations, we could have more than 10, that um, they'll be eligible for a raffle that we'll have at our closing event. Uh, then also then, <clears throat> excuse me, on April 9th, CASA uh, will be um, coordinating events. The first event is an event that they call Hands Around the Courthouse, which will be um, promoting um, the um, the awareness to the uh, to what they're doing, and it's held at the Kane County Courthouse, um, and we hope to have good representation there. Also, um, later that day, that will be at um, four o'clock. Yes, four o'clock, and then at six o'clock, there'll be a. Um, there's going to be a presentation of a Casa mural at uh, the Water Street Studios. And again, that will be at 6 o'clock on that same day, April 9th. Um, other events that we'll be holding out through, throughout the month will be Casa Tuesdays. And Casa Tuesdays, um, what we'll do with Casa Tuesdays is we're having T-shirts made up. Um, we're having a logo that's being put together um, by a student uh, from the high school here in Batavia. And that logo, logo will represent our program. So we'll have the T-shirts printed up, um, and the, the uh, retailers and their employees will wear those T-shirts on Tuesday just as, a, again, another um, way to promote awareness to CASA and the important work that they do. Um, and then uh, the, uh, also uh, that's uh, to the... Um, show solidarity for the event. Also, part of that is there. there's also what we're calling the paint the windows blue. Um, so we'll have donation boxes uh, in the, on these retailers and in the restaurants for gathering these items that will be, um, you know, the essential items that these children need uh, as part of their, you know, when they're given their suitcase and luggage. Um, and so also there'll be donation jars for collecting um, monetary donations, which uh, will display, you know, the, the businesses will be given hearts that, you know, if somebody makes a donation, they can display those in their windows um, as part of that. The, um, the other thing that we'll be doing is soliciting local corporations to make donations to CASA, as well as local businesses and individuals um, during the entire month. Um, we're also partnering with uh, Batavia Schools, and um, th we're not sure exactly. You know, the, the schools are uh, just now come back from winter break, so we're not um, we're not sure exactly what we'll be doing with the schools. But we do plan on doing uh, some activities with the schools um, to involve the the children from the community. And then um, finally, we'll have a closing event on April 30th uh, at uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, during that event, we'll be um, auctioning off the luggage that we had. We'll be presenting the um, uh, gifts to CASA that we uh, gathered during that month. And then um, we'll also, uh, that will be, that will include a dinner and we're coming up with the, the cost of the, the, um, the cost to attend that event. So uh, unless you have questions, um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Sure. And one other thing is the name of the event is um, oh, two, sorry. <laughs> hashtag to Casa from Batavia with love. And the whole point of doing the hashtag from Batavia with love is so that um, in the future we can do for other organizations 
and part of it is just all of us giving back and helping different organizations to raise funds and awareness. And I think that it's a good place for us to start here. Um, CASA is huge, and I, what I have found in talking to people, a lot of people don't even know about CASA. Right. And if you look at the numbers, there's a lot of children in Batavia that are affected by this and that are, and it affects newborns. I mean, they, they're taking newborns out of homes and up to 21 years old, and it, it's very distressing. And all of us raising our own children and see how fortunate children are than to see how unfortunate they are. It's nice that we can all help. You need a question? Yeah, I've got two questions for you. Where can I find a list of essential items? Do you have a website where that would be listed so that if I want to donate an essential item, what is it uh, you're looking for? We have all of that pulled together. And we do yeah. have a Facebook page that everybody can go to and become a part of. I'm going to give you this. I, have, I handed this out at the last meeting, but I'll give you one more of that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. But we will, we're still gathering all that information. Right. Cost is going to provide us with the list of the items. But we do have a Facebook page. We'll it. It's from Batavia with Love, and everybody could go get on it and start following it. And everything we do will be in that Facebook page. That will be the information spot. Businesses will be doing special promotions for this event. We're hoping restaurants do special promotions for this event. We're hoping Tuesday we see blue all over the community. We hope that we can get everybody out to the hands around the courthouse and all of Batavia holding hands there. And it would be really powerful for all of us. And the Blue Tuesday is my second question. Where can I get a shirt? Because, we are pulling because those numbers together. I, I sit here on Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I would be more than happy and very yeah, proud. That would be great. Numbers, wear my blue um, shirt. The Batavia student currently designing the logo for this, and we should get it. They said we'd be able to review it at the end of this week, beginning of next. Okay. Um, CASA is providing us with a lot of stuff we need. CASA is making the t shirts, CASA is providing us with banners. CASA is providing us with the boxes for the, I mean, they're working hand in hand with us. They don't need to provide a t-shirt. I'll buy it. Yeah. Well, we will, we'll get all that out to everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I will reach out to every arm of the committee that's involved in this. So we'll do the city, we'll do the main street, we'll do the chamber, and we'll do, and we'll see how many t-shirts we need. And we're just, it's going to be, I'm, I'm chilled thinking about it. I'm very excited. So. Good. Thank you, everybody, for letting us talk, too. Yeah. Thank you for coming down. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, next up on the agenda is number nine, ordinance 20-01, grant of a variance for a monument sign at 1850 East Fabian Parkway, KRC Holdings, LLC applicant. <coughs> Alderman Callahan. So this is for a monument sign at 1850 East Fabian Parkway uh, to be 10 feet instead of the maximum allowable six feet in the general industrial district this is a variation of four feet uh, it came up because due to the size of the building and for better visibility uh, the applicant is requesting the size of the sign to be 10 feet Drew sure uh, thank you uh, Chairman uh, Callan uh, essentially uh, this is a uh, variance for a, basically a taller sign than what would otherwise be allowed by code uh, the applicant uh, as uh, uh, noted uh, the uh, sign uh, was the, the applicant is seeking a, a larger sign uh, for a couple different factors uh, visibility uh, mainly due to the curve of Fabian Parkway and uh, the uh, presence of a berm uh, that was installed on this property as part of the construction uh, that is was recently completed uh, for this project uh, so the zoning board uh, of appeals did review uh, the uh, matter at a public hearing and uh, in, upon reviewing uh, several uh, photo renderings of different uh, locations uh, along the property for the sign, found that uh, really there is a visibility issue f with a uh, sign at six feet in height, and that uh, the 10 feet as proposed would provide uh, some visibility or more visibility than uh, what would otherwise uh, be allowed. Uh, so there was. Uh, some discussion about just different issues with signs on industrial properties at the plan commission hearing, or the zoning board hearing, I should say. Uh, the applicant did note that generally also there's a preference among industrial, from their experience uh, on industrial properties uh, that the uh, tenants of those buildings prefer to have uh, ground mounted signage uh, because wall signage tends to connotate retail and th they don't necessarily want people that think that there's a retail outlet on this property to go into their pro their industrial property or other industrial properties. Uh, the commission also discussed whether the uh, current sign allowances for wall signs are too generous in the industrial districts, and while the uh, the walls, the ground signage might be too restrictive. So they did ask that we discuss that at a future meeting. 
So um, the Planning Commission did recommend uh, a, a approval of the variance. Uh, they did find four of the findings were met, and we were in a transitional period with the uh, variance procedures. Uh, so they did recommend approval uh, by a vote of five to one. So staff is recommending approval of this ordinance tonight. Does anyone have any questions? What would the, I agree with the wall signs versus the monument signs, what would be the process for that, just direction for them to? Uh, yes, yes, so the, uh, the zoning board did uh, basically just request a discussion of it. Uh, the council can give also direction to initiate a, a text amendment uh, to begin that process formally, uh, but the, the, plan, the zoning board has given direction as well, so. Is the applicant here? Yes. There. Is there anything you want to say to us uh, about this? Pretty straightforward. Uh, good evening. Rolf Anderson, 405 South 1st Street, St. Charles. Um, I'm here on behalf of KRC. Uh, no, Drew did an excellent job of, of kind of reviewing the plan commission process and everything that was discussed. We're here simply to uh, field questions in the event you have any. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the applicant? I believe you were here before with us with the the land yes. and the yeah. spots. Mm -hmm. Still great job on putting the building in. Thank you. We worked at it. With Mike? So this, this is a conditional use, correct? A variance for so them. I mean a variance. So, I mean, it just, we don't want everyone coming in Right. So, 10 foot signs. Uh, so with the current code, uh, anything over six feet would require or requires a variance. Um, if that is changed, you know, that that would then become whatever, whatever the zoning board or you would have an opportunity to review any recommendation the plan commission makes to make a change, whether to go taller or not. So. Right. OK, well, this is a this is a beautiful building. And so I would definitely support it. Thank you. So with that, I recommend approval to City Council Ordinance 20-01, grant of a variance of a monument sign, 1850 East Fabian Parkway, KRC Holdings, applicant. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, I will also uh, ask that another alderman join me in directing staff to uh, go with a text amendment per the uh, points made at the zoning and planning board. I'd agree. Okay. Okay, next up would be ordinance 20-02, annexing 2 South 103 and 2 South 105 Hart Road and 614 and 624 Cottage Road. Alderman Callahan. So this is a continuing uh, efforts to annex the unincorporated islands that we've solicited there this is another one of the mixture of uh, requested and involuntary uh, because we did not hear back from them for these positions and per state law they did not the city did not receive 100 percent of the property value petitions so um, Scott if you wish to discuss any further uh, yeah so this is um one of the last ones that we're working on, this was kind of in progress uh, for a while with, with some of these property owners. Uh, we had contacted them and uh, we did receive one petition. There's four different parcels. One of two parcels are owned by one property owner. Uh, we did see receive a petition from one, the property owner that owns two of them. Uh, we did have a conversation with one of the other ones and then uh, the other one didn't respond at all. So um, we, get, we did get a petition for what would be 50% of the properties. Um, uh, so uh, as, as in keeping with the policy that we have given so far, we, we elected to proceed with an involuntary annexation on, on this particular area. So uh, we are recommending approval of that uh, as part of that. So, Does anyone have any questions for Scott? Are any of the residents for these properties wanting to speak? Seeing none. Uh, I move we approve to City Council annexation of properties at 2S103 and 2S105 Hart Road and 614 and 624 Cottage Road 
in Batavia. Rear. Second. Uh, motion by Callahan, second by Malay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes. Consent. 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 Okay, next up will be uh, approving boundary line agreement with the Village of North Aurora, Ordinance 20-03. This is the boundary line that we've been discussing for <laughs> at least a year <laughs> or more. Uh, Scott, you can take this one since you have all the information on it. Sure. Uh, this is, as, as you've said, this is uh, an agreement we've been working on for over a year now. Uh, this kind of got put on hiatus because of uh, some things that uh, North Aurora is working out with some of the other communities, with Aurora and, and uh, uh, trying to and, and Sugar Grove and trying to resolve those. Uh, in the meantime, from the time that we started the discussion with North Aurora, we were able to begin and complete a boundary agreement discussion with uh, Sugar Grove. So uh, this uh, is um, <coughs> the final culmination of, of where we are with, uh, with, with the agreement with them. So the main provision is this. The line stays more or less the same uh, from... Uh, essentially from Hart Road on the east end uh, through uh, Randall Road. The only exception is uh, uh, North Aurora did annex Lippold Park, which is along Route 25. Um, that is in the Fox Valley Park District uh, boundary as well as owned by the Fox Valley Park District. So they, they were able to annex that because essentially the current boundary agreement doesn't really cover that area. So they were allowed to do that. Um, so other than that, it stays the same, uh, follows uh, the river and then uh, Mooseheart Road into Orchard Road. It follows the pipeline and everything all the way out to about Deer Path Road. From there is kind of where the changes are a little bit. Um, going west on CV Road, uh, it then kind of hugged the uh, boundary, the existing boundary of North Aurora and, uh, and then ended uh, down further south uh, near uh, um, Tanner Road. Um, but based on the discussions we had with North Aurora, they wanted to have a little more room to grow. Uh, they felt they were better able to service the utilities in that area. City doesn't have any. City of Batavia doesn't have any real utilities in that in that vicinity. Uh, a lot of that property has been acquired by the Forest Preserve and trying to provide linkages to the Dick Young Forest Preserve. Um, so we felt that it would be appropriate to uh, shift that line somewhat north, and we had had some discussion with the council about that before. So, so the line essentially then extends, instead of hugging the, the North Aurora boundary line, it goes due west along CV Road and ends at Bliss Road, which matches with the Sugar Grove boundary agreement. The one caveat is this area in red is what we're calling the option area. Uh, essentially, this is area that is not owned by the Forest Preserve right now, uh, but it is bounded on three sides by the Forest Preserve. And what we're saying here is that this area is, is the uh, area that uh, is kind of a first come first serve area. So whatever municipality is able to get there and service it with utilities would be able to annex that in whole or in part. If after 10 years it hasn't been annexed by either municipality, then it reverts to the boundary line uh, being at, at CV Road and they would just be on the, on the Batavia side of the boundary line. So it essentially, you know, if, if North Aurora should find some development and is able to grow in that direction, then great. If not, then you know it reverts back to, to Batavia. Uh, also, if the Forest Preserve does buy some of those properties because it is you know surrounded on three sides by the Dick Young Preserve, then it really would probably be annexed by neither municipality at that point. Does anyone have any questions? Is anyone from the public? And also, the public hearing will be at the on the twenty first for for this as well. Okay, I recommend approval to city council of ordinance 20-03 approving a boundary agreement with the village of north aurora second motion by callahan second by meitzler all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries. That'll, that'll need to be in the regular because of the public hearing right so. kudos on corralling all those cats mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> considering it's uh, my former employee it was interesting the discussion so. <laughs> Next up for community development is uh, Ordinance 20-04, establishing special, <coughs> establishing special service area for the Nagel Industrial Park, Plan Unit Development, Farmstead 3 Development. And so this one is the question of, shall the city establish an SSA number 42 for the Nagel Industrial Park? Um, the background on this is that the city council approved Ordinance 19-80, approving the establishment of an SSA back on 
uh, November 18th of last year. A hearing date was established for June 20th of this year, but was moved to the 21st due to the Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, city has published a notice for the public hearing for all the affected uh, property owners. City will conduct a, prop a public hearing on July 21st and afterwards can approve the ordinance 19, or I'm sorry, 20-04, which would establish SSA 42. Scott, would you like to describe this further? Uh, yeah, the hearing would actually be on January 21st, not right, January sorry. 21st. Uh, but the, the area in green is the area that we're talking about. Uh, it's basically Nagel Boulevard uh, and, uh, and Fabian Parkway on the north end. Uh, this actually was established by ordinance back in 2000, uh, but we did not record the ordinance in time for one reason or another. And so if you don't record the ordinance within, six, within 60 days of passage, it, it lapses. So um, this was part of the annexation and development <coughs> agreement was to have the special service area in place. Uh, we had discussions with the original developer recently and asked him, uh, you know, how do you want to handle this? Because um, the city is actually supposed to be collecting 45% of the maintenance of the detention pond, which is at the south end of this project, uh, to, for, to offset some of the maintenance. It's a regional basin, but this, you know, benefits this development quite a bit. Um, and so the developer said, you know what, let's go ahead and, and you know, do a special service area again like we originally did. Um, they, don't have an active, they don't have an active property owners association, so they felt that that would be the most effective way to do it. Plus, based on the fact that it would be, uh, you know, additional tax, there may be some tax benefits to the property owners, but for deductions and things like that, depending on how, you know, they, they, they you know, do their uh, income tax forms and whatnot. So uh, so that's why we did this. Uh, it's going to pay for 45% of the regular maintenance costs of this. Uh, so we, we anticipate it's going to be an active SSA. We anticipate the cost would be about $0.10 cents per $100 of assessed valuation based on what our maintenance costs have been so far. Does anyone have any questions for Scott? Does anyone from the public have any questions? With that, I will recommend to City Council approval of Ordinance 20-04, establishing uh, Special Service Area 42 for the Nagel Industrial Park, uh, PUD Farmstead Number 2, Fabian Parkway and Nagel Boulevard. And this would be after the public hearing on January 21st. Right. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Knopp. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I just have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Next up will be uh, resolution 20-005R, authorizing sale of municipally owned real estate at 919 Smith Court. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Very excited about this one. <clears throat> so everyone may remember this is the city owned lot that is between Smith Court and AGS. It is highly used with the students over at AGS. And now there has been an established uh, sidewalk through there uh, from our agreement with the redevelopment of the school back in 2007. So it only took them a couple years to get it in. Um, and now based on that, a lot of the property owners were taking uh, care of the mowing of that uh, to begin with. So we are looking to sell the city property. Scott, if you want to explain yes. the... And so uh, we had some discussions with both the adjacent property owners. Um, you can kind of see the sidewalk. This is a plat of survey that was done after the sidewalk construction was completed. Uh, we had uh, an easement from uh, the property owners to the north and to the south for the property, for the sidewalk to cross their property in part because otherwise going on the entire city property was problematic because of tree removal and some utility boxes and other things like that. So uh, we asked for, um, and or I should say the school district asked for, because this is technically a school district sidewalk, uh, asked for uh, easements from these properties, which they did grant. And then as part of that, we did a license agreement with the school district for the part that was going across the city property. We wanted to have the sidewalk laid out so that then we could determine a property line for, for this property and then decide, you know, where those two parcels were going to be split and sold. Um, during the discussions after the sidewalk was done, we found that one of the property owners wasn't really willing to buy the property, and they had some concerns and hesitancy about it. Um, so then we talked to one of the other property owners to the north, who uh, we've done some land swaps in cooperation with them, 
and uh, they have agreed to uh, acquire the whole property uh, as, as part of uh, their estate holdings and then to perhaps sell that at a, some point in the future to an adjacent property owner. It's much easier for a private property owner to sell it than a city is because of all the you know, state requirements we have to follow as part of any land transaction. Um, so they may end up you know, acquiring it and then selling the other piece to the other property owner at some, at some point in the future. Um, as part of this, uh, the properties to the north, uh, as you recall, we, that was one of the areas that we annexed not too long ago. Uh, part of the property was in the city, but uh, the houses that were there were not. Um, so they are on ComEd Electric, and we are working on a deal with them to, uh, as part of the purchase, to instead of paying us for the actual land, uh, to agree to connect to the city electric. And that's about a wash based on the, in, uh, the cost estimates that we've done for that. So uh, essentially what it would be is an in-kind services uh, type of deal where they would pay for the electric burial of the city electric line. They have a, a overhead ComEd lines, and that would improve their reliability because they wouldn't have an overhead line anymore. So that's, that's what we're looking at doing as part of this sale, and uh, you know, provided that we can work it out and they're the successful bidder, uh, I think it's a win-win-win for everybody. I think it's been great, the cooperation and the discussions that we've had with the property owners. They've been good stewards of taking care of the property and being good neighbors with that parcel with the, uh, the main intention of providing a safe access to the school for a lot of the neighbors in, in that entire subdivision. Does anyone have any questions on this? Anyone from the public? I recommend approval to City Council Resolution 20-005-R, authorizing the sale of municipally owned real estate at 919 Smith Court. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And that could go on consent then. That can go on consent. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next up will be number 14, resolution 20-004-R, uh, authorizing city administrator to apply for Kane County development funds for execution of all ne necessary documents. So Gary's going to mm -hmm. take this one. Yes. For the last several years, the city has actually been a recipient of community development block grant funds. We've used those funds to resurface roadways in the near northeast side of town here, just on North River Street. Um, those areas that are determined to be eligible for CDBG are based on um, income levels within those areas. And so we just did a new income survey and found additional potential areas that we could um, serve, and that would be basically between um, Washington Street going east to Prairie, and then from north of Wilson, um, right in that immediate area. And so we have submitted an application, and as Rahad indicated in his memo, uh, we didn't find out from the county until the very last minute. So the county is, um, we did meet the deadline, but we have not met this deadline with respect to um, legislative approval. So the county is uh, open and letting us uh, submit this after our next council meeting. So we are recommending uh, approval of resolution 20-004, <coughs> which basically officially authorizes the administrator to assign the um, application for CDBG funding, and fingers crossed, hopefully we're going to get $94,000 this year. Okay. Any questions? Everybody understand? Okay, I'll make the motion that we recommend to council um, resolution 20-004, um, uh, authorizing city administrator to apply for Kane County development funds and execution of all necessary documents. Second. Motion by Wolf, second by Knopp. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Consent? Fourth word, thank you. Can go on the consent. Okay, next up will be resolution 20-011. R, authorizing staff to submit grade crossing protection fund with uh, Illinois Commerce Commission crossing safety improvement program for Prairie Street Railroad crossing installation. So late last fall, the city was informed uh, that we were the recipients of federal funds to perform what we're calling phase two of the Prairie Street improvements. Phase one of the Prairie Street improvements will be constructed this summer, the summer of 2020, and they basically extend from Webster Street south to Pine. 
We are not, as part of phase one, we're not doing the intersection or the railroad crossings. Uh, we have now received federal funding to do phase two, which would include that intersection at Wilson and the railroad crossings. And um, technically, this would also qualify for, it meets all the criteria for ICC funding uh, for railroad safety improvements. As Rahad indicates in his memo, I mean, as you all know, it's, it's not going to be classified as an unsafe crossing. I mean, there's very low train volume there, very low traffic, um, very low uh, speed limits there. Um, depending on the pool of applicants and the available funding, we may still get some money through the ICC uh, to make those improvements. So it's certainly worth our while, our time in, in submitting an application. Uh, the worst they can do is say no. So really this is uh, seeking your authority to submit applications to ICC for potential funding, as well as as our consultants uh, get into the phase, uh, phase one part of this, uh, to authorize uh, other funding opportunities that we may uh, identify and, and to apply for those as well. Anybody have any questions or comments? I think this is just one of those things that we have to take the opportunity <laughs> exactly. uh, to try to get the funds. It's, it's free money. Yep, right. Yep. Okay, I'll make the motion that we recommend to Council Resolution 20-11-R, authorizing staff to submit Grade Crossing Protection Fund with the ICC uh, safety improvement program for Prairie Street Railroad Crossing installation. Second. Okay. Motion by Wolf, second by Meitzler. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and that will go on consent. Okay. Next up would be um, 16, which would be resolution 20-006R, authorization to purchase two 2020 Ford F-150 trucks for $53,255 for Morrow Brothers Ford. Carrie? Um, this item, again, these trucks are budgeted. Um, one thing that's happened since this item, this item was originally on the agenda about a month ago. Um, one thing that's happened, and, and I haven't even had a chance to talk to Alder Manure yet, is that we have discovered that the Colorado, which is the smaller version of Chevy or mid-sized version of Chevy's truck, is on the state purchase um, right over there next to Chief Ewell. I left my paper, which lists the numbers. But basically, <laughs> Scott Haynes has gone through and checked the Colorado state purchase price for apples to apples comparison, so V6 or V4 engines, um, you know, the, the, the similar options. And um, basically, I, I can go grab the paper and I can actually give you the ex actual dollars. Uh, but over the life of the vehicles, there's no savings going with Colorado. It's within $500 over 75,000 miles at assuming three gallons per mile. And thanks, Chief. And so I, I, I've got them here if we want to dive into the numbers. Um, so staff is consider, are still sticking with its recommendation for purchase of the, so the F-150 pickups. Um, another consideration, and I, I think just a reminder, we have a fleet mechanic of one, literally one person who does all of our fleet work. Um, that fleet mechanic, there is an advantage to having that fleet mechanic work on the same models of vehicles all the time as opposed to having to learn 10 different models of vehicles when you're one person, having to store parts for 10 different models of vehicles, or, or even two or three models of vehicles. So we have other F-150s in the, in the fleet, and we're certainly recommending to stick with uh, the F-150s. Um, for the engineering truck, and I, I just go to the bottom line here, comparing the apples to apples, um, with both vehicles having the same, same V6 engine, uh, the purchase price and no fuel economy advantage, the difference would be a savings of about 1400 to stay with the F-150, but then when we add on the options that we're going to get, which is the um, upgraded tires and the auto start, then the, then the difference between the two gets to, that's where the $600, $184, that's that one. So uh, it, all these numbers are within a, f a fraction of each other over the life of the vehicles. Um, for the meter truck, the total difference over the life of the vehicles, because those are more apples to apples, is $689 uh, to go with the 150 actually a savings to go with the F-150. So we're recommending purchase of these two trucks uh, from uh, Merle Ford uh, for a total of $53,255, and the budget that we have included for those two is $60,000, so we are under budget. 
you have any questions? Just comment. I, I appreciate the due diligence there. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, I had also emailed a couple of our, our state representatives to say it seems kind of ridiculous that we're not having more vehicles like within Ford that you could have a, a Ranger. A Ranger may end up being a better deal because now you're talking that they're going to have a lower cost for what is their lower cost vehicle, where Chevy may not be giving the same discount that Ford is. Um, just overall, it just seems like not just for us, but for the state and for every municipality in the state, if they had a better variety of things, everybody could start saving some money. But um, I appreciate you looking at the details there, and I'm not going to – having the um, – like you talked about having one person servicing these vehicles and having um, many of the same vehicles, I, I see the cost savings there as well. So thank you. Anybody else? Joe? And I've just got a comment, and it kind of echoes what Mark said. I was glad to hear that you've got – other numbers for other vehicles where where it shows that other options are being looked at and i know a lot of times when i see some of the memos come out that's the question in my mind is what are the other options were they looked at if those were included in memos a lot of the questions i have would go away and i think that one is, is a good sign that it's exactly the kind of information we're looking at so that we can remind our neighbors how we're spending their money and we purchase vehicles, especially passenger vehicles, light duty vehicles, are, are traditionally always purchased through the state purchase process. Um, I wish I could go to, you know, the local Ford dealership and purchase a, 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 an F-150 for $27,000. I mean, <laughs> at the retail level, it's twice that amount. Yeah. Um, exactly. So that's why we go through the state purchases, because there's such a discount in the volume pricing. Um, and so for those, for those purchases, um, we don't go out and explore Toyotas and Fords and Chevys and, because, frankly, it, it, it's, 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 it, the pricing at the state purchase can't be beat. There's no place that can beat it. You know, Gary, I'll, I'll say, too, I, I can appreciate you wanting to just deal with the one model or the one manufacturer. You know, we have many discussions on lighting throughout the city, and mm -hmm. and you have all these different lights and fixtures that you have to kind of warehouse, which is an added cost also. And so it's so it's I, I can fully appreciate what you have to say about that. And I know we're working towards yeah, same we have thing transitioned with towards consolidating and standardizing yes. lights mm -hmm. for that Absolutely. very reason. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll uh, make the motion that we recommend to Council Resolution 20-006R, authorizing purchase of the two 2020 Ford F-150 trucks for $53,255. Second. Motion by Wolf, second by Ewer. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. I can go on consent. Okay, <coughs> the other side. <laughs> Uh, next up will be uh, Resolution 20-008R, authorizing execution of a grant agreement with Batavia Main Street for development of the boardwalk shops. Got that? As a follow-up to our discussion, uh, last month uh, city staff has worked with uh, Main Street uh, and they have uh, reached um, a terms of their agreement. It covers everything from uh, construction costs, utility billing, uh, quarterly reports uh, by Main Street to the city. Um, and the funding source, remember this is uh, leftover, these are remaining funds from that state uh, microloan uh, program. And um, Laura, do you have anything else? Um, yes, so Main Street is making a request that um, the city provide the first $300 per month of electric to the site. <laughs> is there only additional requests beyond what has been provided in the grant agreement. Do we have an estimate of what, what they we expect a power draw to be on the site? Or where so do we know how they arrived at 300 or? Um, Bob, did you want to speak to that or Jamie? The 300 came up basically from an average of what the um, shops, chalets, and Muskegon were. Uh, at this point, we don't uh, foresee anybody putting in air conditioning this year. Uh, if they do, and they would like to do that, the tenants would like to do that, there'll be an upcharge for that. So however the city would like to work that out, but initially it's just uh, lighting and computers, and that's about it, really, in each shop. 
I really don't see more than $15, $20 a unit at the most. That little usage, that little draw. Okay. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions or any discussion? Sorry, I, I, I didn't have an opportunity to talk with Laura about this, but I'll put on my electric utility hat for a second. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think council should decide if the credit will come out of the general fund for economic development purposes or out of the utility fund for electric. I think that's just something you guys should designate. Well, that'd be my question is what under where we're going to take this out of. And I would say if we're going to do this, it's only for one year to start it off. We do that for a year and then we'll revisit it again at the beginning of next year after we see how these pan out. Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that way we get a good average of what it looks mm -hmm. like for the season since this is kind of an unknown. Right. And I think this is something that we've all kind of bought into that I think if we're going to do this, I think we support it. You know, and I don't have a problem if we spend that money to do that to support this to get it started. There's no other uh, questions then? I would uh, I move that we would fund. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, while we do know that some of it's unknown for us, um, this is done in many communities across the United States. And the reason why uh, this was initially brought to us is as a good way for economic development in our downtown as an initial uh, incubator style business. It has a lot of bonuses to it. And uh, there's a lot of data out there that have showed this has been successful in other communities and i think by learning what muskegon has done and other communities we kind of tailored uh, the learning curve that they they might have had on these to make sure that these go into uh, become a success um, which as we've seen the part that i know that we love the most about it is this has turned just from an economic development idea into a community project with uh, Main Street getting involved, with business owners getting involved, uh, with business owners developing uh, or uh, donating, and which is, I know, really important to a lot of us is the yeah. schools portion in this where uh, students are going to take part in the buildings and trade and learn construction, architecture, uh, it, that is just the Batavia stamp on this that I really love. And so was the decision made that the electric funding would be from uh, general fund or electric fund? Isn't there still a bal balance left in that economic uh, mm -hmm. yes. grant? Yes. <clears throat> so I, mean, just I think it should be have it come part from of that, there. I would yes. think. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. My suggestion. For the first year only. Yeah. For the first year only. Yeah, one year. Which we would revisit. <coughs> we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. That's fine. With, with those changes, then I would move uh, that we approve resolution 20 uh, 8 R um, authorizing uh, execution of a grant agreement with Batavia Main Street for the development of the boardwalk shops. Second. second. A motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, let's, let's talk about this. Ground. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next up will be resolution 20-12-R, authorizing <coughs> Western Utility Contractors for uni of University Park, Illinois, to perform fiber relocation along Mitchell Road for an amount not to exceed $40,575.65, plus a 10% contingency amount. Alderman O'Brien. So we have a fiber optic cable going out to the I-88 fiber network, and it's run along Hart Road and Mitchell Road, and it is connected to Batavia poles, AT&T poles, and ComEd poles. ComEd has informed the city that uh, they're taking down their poles, and so we uh, had to do something. So we decided to relocate all this con all this cabling underground. We got a price for 45000 almost $45,500, but then staff partnered with Verizon and Verizon also has to put theirs on the ground, and so they were able to give us a savings of approximately uh, $8,500. Because now the price, we got, went to Western Utility, went to five contractors, and went to Western Utility, for, and they quoted 
Batavia's amount and Verizon's amount total at $76,834, with Batavia's, Batavia's participation at $36,886.95. So we had quite a savings. Thank you, Gary, for that. Uh, we chose Western Utility. Batavia does not have any experience with Western Utility, but Verizon does, and Verizon highly recommends them. So we are going with uh, Western Utility. And one other mention is that it is uh, a budgeted item that we passed for uh, $75,000, and uh, we're quite a ways beneath that budget. So I think it's a, it's a good job, well done by, by staff on this. So would anyone care to make a motion? Anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make? I'd like to see that we're partnering up with somebody and reducing the cost on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That helped a great deal. So, uh, Gary, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I will say, and without getting too far into the weeds, um, this is all being driven because of the new building that was constructed at the northeast corner of Mitchell and I-88. Uh, so we did pursue the avenue of having the new building developer pay these costs. Verizon also pursued that avenue. Um, ComEd actually even also pursued, but, but, but in the Good end, yeah. this is coming back to us. So, and we are obligated to ComEd. Our obligation ultimately is to ComEd. So. Right. So I thought it was a good thing, though. And, uh, you know, we do have this fiber going through the city. It's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, asset to our city. And that is servicing also, uh, who is it servicing, Gary? It's servicing NIU. Yep. Uh, School District, and, Park District. Right. Uh, Fermilab. Fermilab also, which yep. is, it's, it's, a, it's a very good utility to have. So uh, would anyone care to make a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Maitla, second by Malay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Gary. Okay. All right. Um, that can go on consent. So next up will be a uh, discussion on the uh, reconsider whether or not to allow uh, recreational cannabis dispensaries and where. Sure. Um, so as we know, on January 1st of 2020, recreational cannabis became legal in the state of Illinois. The uh, Committee of the Whole previously had a discussion on August 27th when um, very few municipalities at that time had decided whether they were going to opt in or opt out. At that point, um, we wanted to learn more, see what other communities were doing. In the meantime, we updated our zoning code to add definitions that had not previously um, been included in our zoning code and addressed issues that uh, were brought forth by the new statute, but recreational cannabis dispensaries remained a prohibited use under our zoning code. And that is the status today. And late last year, the Committee of the Whole determined that um, some time has passed and that you would like to revisit the discussion. And so the questions um, that arise are, uh, number one, whether recreational cannabis dispensaries should be allowed in the city of Batavia. And if city council determines that they should be allowed, where in the city should they be allowed under uh, which zoned areas um, and will recreational dispensaries be a conditional use or a special use how many dispensaries would be allowed and will the city impose a tax on the uh, sale of recreational cannabis under the statute the city is allowed to impose up to a three percent tax and then also whether or not on-site consumption will be allowed where recreational cannabis is sold. Okay. So those are the, the things which we need to decide. I, I guess you know, the more I thought about this, as we had talked about at the, at the last meeting, <coughs> that we really have three questions. Yes or no, where it's going to be, if we allow it, and what the tax rate's going to be on it. I think those are the, the three main, I think, that we have to come to. And I think the first one, before we go much further into any of this, is whether or not we think we want to allow it. Because if we don't have 10 votes to allow it, 
the rest of the discussion doesn't mean anything. So I think that's the, the real crux of where I think we're at. And I think that's what we need to decide. And if tonight is the night, I think that's where we should go. Because I think that's the discussion we should have, how each one of us feels about whether or not we want to allow this. Um, because if we do, then there's a lot more questions to ask and answer. And so I think that's where we're at tonight. I know there's a lot of people in the audience that want to say something or would like to hear what we have to say about it. So I guess my first question is to the 14 of us, do we want to discuss it amongst ourselves up here first? Do we want to listen to people from the audience, um, what they have to say before we have our discussion? How do we want to handle it? Do it like last time. Let them talk, and then we'll have our discussion move from there. I'm okay with that. I think depending on how many people we have here tonight to talk, I think we're going to try and limit it to about three minutes so we don't have, you know, a full night or two of discussions about this again. And I guess I'll just try to keep it civil, and if not, I'll stop the meeting. That's about as, as easy as I can make it said. And really all we need from you is your name. We do not need an address. Um, the only thing that's required for us is in the minutes is a name. If you have anything that you would like to distribute to us, you can leave it with the recording secretary, and that can go into the um, record. Okay. Who would like to start us tonight? Duke Wall, 811 Manchester Avenue, Batavia, Illinois. In the last episode of Does Batavia Need Pot Shops, Duke tried to convince his wife to move out of Batavia because Batavia City Council had lost their collective minds. Well, it didn't work. Duke's wife wants to stay and pray. <clears throat> All of her friends are here, her church is here, her history is here. So that leaves Duke only one other option, and that is to stay and fight. I'm having too much fun being retired. But coming to City Hall to argue an issue like this is not my idea of having fun. I had an email exchange with Alderman Euler. Euler? Is that how he's that pronounced? Euler. Yes. And uh, Alderman Chanzit. They asked me how I felt about pot shops and why I felt that way. And I told them one, what and why. But then the emails started to turn into a debate. Well, there is no debate. Debates are smelly, just like Chicago City Democrats do. Refugees from Chicago fled the, the city, and their craziness there drove them out. And they come to small towns like Batavia, but they bring their crazy ideas with them. Well, I've got three ideas. I'd like three things from the council. I don't think I'm going to get them, but I'm going to ask. I'd like the aldermen to go to church. I'd like them to ask their priest, their minister, their rabbi, whoever, Ask them what they think about pot shops in Batavia. The second thing I'd like is the city to put up an additional web page on their website containing the statements of each and every alderman here stating why they need to have pot shops in Batavia. The third thing, I'd like to, I'd like to point out that the city of Batavia, if you guys are going to continue with this sort of thing. There is a, an election coming up in November, and we can have a referendum vote, and we can find out what the people really think about pot shops in Batavia. Now, some of you folks on the council probably do remember, and some of you might not have even heard about it, but we had a fight. The citizens had a fight with the park district over the proposed recreational center in downtown Batavia. Us citizens had to scramble to fight and get the question put on the ballot at the county level. After the question appeared on the ballot, we all know what Batavia really felt. And that was no. The park district made all kinds of false claims that the people wanted a recreational center, but now we know why, and we know what. The only way to find out what people really want is to put it on a ballot. But I don't think the city council wants to do that. They want to go ahead and make up their own minds. Go to your clergy, ask them what they think. 
make a statement on the website as to what you think Batavia, why Batavia should or should not have recreational pot shops, and then put the issue before the voters. I don't think I'm going to get any of this, but I'm calling you out. Do it. Do it. I'm done now. I'm going to go home and check my blood pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, who would like to come up next? Come on up. I thought that was a great segue because I'm local clergy. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Lilo Koshevsky and I'm at 911 Hanson Street. And uh, I'm going to try to stay in three minutes. I think most of you are here when I came up to present before. And so I, I trust that um, you looked into the repercussions of legalized marijuana. I, I really trust that you did because the evidence is there, the documentation is there now. The previous states um, that have legalized it um, have suffered significant consequences. And so I want to reiterate them, but I'll do it within three minutes. And so the best way I can do this is um, what I shared before by way of confession. Uh, officer, please don't arrest me. But in the 70s, I used cannabis every day for about eight years. And it was 10 times less potent than what it is now. And I experienced psychosis. I experienced paranoia. My behavior changed. And this was in 1974. And so I had to learn the hard way. I've had to make a lot of mistakes. But I am different because of it. Um, but it's because I had to walk away from it. And so I understand that this is about also about tax dollars. Above tax dollars, what I think the people are looking for here mostly is a moral backbone one that cares first for the people, the community, and to do what's right. I think when we all get sworn into public places, we take an oath, and I think the oath is to serve. I serve as a pastor in a local church around here because I feel my calling is to consider others better, to serve them, to help them. What I do, though, is I pastorally counsel people who have drug addiction, alcohol addiction, they hate it. They want to be removed from it. I've got about one minute, right? Um, here's the challenge, I think, that's on the floor right now. Um, because we all have to accept our consequences. And this is what I believe the consequence will be if we don't stand out and simply say, no, we won't be a part of it. You're not responsible for the other cities. We're responsible for Batavia. Number one, if we do forward this, we contribute to increased emergency room waits. The Denver metro area is at about seven hours right now. We will contribute to handicapping our law enforcement that serves us so well. We will contribute uh, to turn cannabis consumption over to our young people. It just happens that way. And it can create lifelong mental illness. Um, Ultimate responsibility to serve and protect our community, I think, is in this room right here. And that's the decision I'm hoping and praying you'll make. I would love to talk to anybody who would like to talk to me about the experiences of marijuana. It's really fun at first. It really, really is. But it is detrimental long term. And that is yet to be seen here in our city. I also have, um, if anybody is interested, there's links to all the documented evidence and uh, studies that have been already posted. Um, where did you say to leave them? With Jenny. Right here. Okay. Sorry for all the highlights on it. That's it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Come on up. Next, uh, Father Jim Parker. I won't reiterate what I mentioned mm -hmm. before, but just amen to my brother in the ministry. Uh, it's everything he just said. So I've been a priest since 2003. And just like my brother, I meet people that have a lot of addictions, problems in their lives. And there's so many addictions out there. So just to make this more readily available here in Batavia, it's going to lead uh, to more addictions. It's going to lead younger kids are going to get a hold of this as well from older siblings, others uh, in the family, in fact, from, um, from parents. You're going to get uh, parents that uh, are going to be negligent in their duties. It's going to affect school. It's going to affect employment. It's just the ramifications are just incredible. I go to Kane County Jail uh, once a month, 
offer mass there, and I go to a couple of different pods and meet with um, uh, the inmates there. And uh, when they gave us the training, when we started there, they said a lot of the different people, the drugs are getting them from their parents, you know, at a young age. So I'm just afraid just if it comes here, uh, and studies show that, I mean, it's just going to spread the addiction. So I just urge you, just to say no. To, to, to say no. Just let's keep Batavia good for the children. Uh, we had the, our speakers at the very beginning from CASA. Well, a lot of the wonderful work that they do, you have parents that are making it real simple, are messed up, right? And they're negligent in their duties. And so thank God for CASA, they help quite a bit, but they can't take care of all the children out there. So just, uh, I just urge you, everyone here, just uh, to, to not let this come to Batavia. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Hartman. Um, I'm the founder and director of Point to Point, a harm reduction program that serves people who use drugs, and I'm also a resident of Batavia. I'm here to address the blatant stigmatization of drug users that's occurring in these conversations. Cannabis use is not a moral issue. Drug use is not a moral issue. No one questions your morality when you order a beer, which you can do at six different places in walking distance from here. For our community to say that alcohol is fine but cannabis is not is problematic and dangerous. The conversations regarding cannabis use is saturated with racism and classism that is a result of the failed war on drugs. We need to do better as a community to recognize the varied reasons that people use substances and not vilify them and act as if they are not welcome in our town. That is not who we should be. Every person who struggles with a substance use disorder feels isolated because of stigma and shame regarding their use. Continuing to demonize them is keeping people who use drugs in the shadows and making them less safe. We are sending a clear message to people who use substances that they don't belong in Batavia, pushing them farther away. We cannot loudly contribute to stigma against people who use drugs while also wanting to combat the overwhelming overdose rates in our county. If we want to see people alive, we need to change the language regarding this. I would also like to take this moment to remind people that we are not arguing whether or not to legalize it. That has already been done. Stigma kills people, and that's what these conversations are. If you want a thriving community, you need to lead with compassion and love thy neighbor. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Doug Lanham. I'm at uh, 806 Mark Twain Trail in Batavia. Uh, I don't have a prepared statement, and um, it, I will not be nearly as eloquent as the person that just came up before me. Um, but it will dovetail on what she said. So I'd venture to say that almost everyone in this room uh, drinks alcohol on occasion, maybe socially, maybe they have one cocktail when they get home after work, maybe they have a beer, they get together with friends, and, and it's okay. Prohibition ended overnight, about 90 years ago, so I don't think anyone in this room was alive during that time, and if you were, you weren't old enough to remember it. So alcohol has become normalized and has become socialized and it's become accepted. And at almost every Batavia City function, from the Windmill City Festival to the various events that we have in town, alcohol is sold and served and celebrated. It's part of our culture. It's part of society here in Batavia. And that's a good thing. You can choose not to drink if you so choose, or you can choose to drink responsibly. Um, I would say that although many people in this room probably do occasionally drink, um, I doubt that most of you are alcoholics. So the same can be said with cannabis use. I also smoked cannabis back in the 70s every day for a number of years. So I can speak to that as well. The, the issue or, or part of the uh, part of what's different then was that the cannabis that you got was whatever someone had, that whatever they happened to have, or whatever the person standing next to you at the Almond Brothers concert gave you. Um, now it is much more controlled, it's regulated, there is much more science behind how it's delivered, how it's uh, dosed, and I, I will say that, you know, I, I drove past at least a dozen 
uh, establishments on my way here tonight, all within the city of Batavia, in my seven minute drive here, where alcohol can be purchased either for consumption on premises or to take home and, and enjoy at home. Um, I'll wrap up here with just tying back to the stigma. The, it, it's no more accurate to say that people that smoke cannabis are uh, without jobs and living in their mother's basement, uh, stoned, than it is accurate to say that everyone who, who occasionally drinks alcohol is an alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. I'm Mary Nee Camp. Um, I am a dissenter. I do not feel that recreational cannabis in our town is appropriate. And it's not because there's a stigma. My husband's a psychologist. He works with many people, some who have addictions, some who don't. He works with homeless people in Lazarus House. We both have volunteered. There's no lack of love. I think the question is about responsibility versus compassion. We talk a lot about compassion in our community, but what really is compassion? Letting people do whatever they want? I think those of us who are parents know that that's false. Just because something is permissible does not mean it is beneficial. I don't want my children exposed to a more increased potential for the connection with drugs, especially in schools where my one teenage daughter at Batavia High School says, Mom, the bathrooms already smell like vaping and I don't feel safe to go in there. And the academic um, achievements are lowering. I don't think we can ignore that our youth are affected by our choices and that the greatest level of compassion and responsibility a human can exhibit is by restricting their freedoms for the sake of those who are younger, weaker, or more at need in their community. And that would be mostly our children. I don't think anybody I've never met in Batavia in my 27 years here would say that they care more about economic tax increase than they do about people. That's one of the reasons why people love Batavia. They don't like Geneva. Batavia's cute, it's small. And yes, indeed, we do allow alcohol, and the state has agreed to allow legalization of cannabis. I'd just rather it be a driving distance away so that my daughter doesn't have to wonder if the girl next to her is high. And my 12-year-old, who literally said to me today, Mom, you usually can't tell when somebody is high except for their behavior or because they're careless. My 12-year-old, who merely had a class with a tiny drug unit, she had a friend last year who betrayed her and disappointed her by drug use at an early age at 11. My child came from grade school and then was introduced to this at 11 without it being legalized. Yes, it will be more prevalent. And what do we want to tell our youth? I want to tell them I am compassionate. If I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it under certain situations and in certain places. I myself would not choose to use. I prefer to be in control of my own sensibilities and to find natural ways to get high. And no, I don't drink alcohol either. It's a moral choice and a physical choice, but I don't even need one drink. I think if I drink once a year, it's a big party for me. So I don't need any of it, but I don't judge those who choose. But is our choice and right to choice more important than our compassion and our concern for those who would indeed have it in hand, mostly our children? And they already are exposed to that in the schools. Batavia is no longer a place where I would tell people to come for a great education. Hands down, I have considered leaving Batavia because of our schools and the experience my teenagers have had. So I think those of us here really do need to take the um, other gentleman's idea and put it on a ballot. I think many of us who have children see firsthand more than those who sit and talk about things and do research. My 15-year-old, when she first said, when um, a response from a gentleman in the email that I exchanged months ago about this, she said, Mom, that's so stupid. Duh, everybody in my school is going to fake an ID so they can get a hold of it. Ugh. And I thought if a 15-year-old who doesn't do research has that as her experience, we need to give credence to that. Just because we're adult doesn't mean we know everything. Our children are suffering, as all children do. But growing up into a world where we say our freedoms are more important than putting safe boundaries around our children is not the community that I moved here to be part of. <coughs> Next. Good evening. Uh, my name's Bob Vaughn, 1301 Town Avenue. Um, 
relatively new to town, only been here a couple of years, so I don't even know who my aldermen are. Who is, who is my alderman? Depends 1301 on town. Other side. Right here. Drew and Keenan. Oh, me and, yeah. me and oh okay. All right. Well, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, not only is my wife and I here, obviously I'm retired. Uh, my grandkids are here. Uh, my uh, son in law and daughter are here. We moved here because Batavia is a great town. And I personally think they have great schools. Um, and I would like to see it stay that way. Uh, I grew up and lived in. A town just down the road, Aurora, uh, and it's got its attributes. Could have lived anywhere, but we wanted to be in Batavia. Let me just share with you, my life has been spent, my professional life, about half of it's been in the public sector, local government, about half of it's been in the private sector. I'm currently in the private sector. And um, I think you've got heavy decisions to make for the benefit of the community. One of the things I do today is I am involved with a private foundation, the largest private foundation in Kane County, and we provide grants to nonprofit organizations, several of which are substance abuse organizations. Now, I'm not an expert on substance abuse, but when we provide funding, and we've provided between Breaking Free and Serenity House alone uh, several million dollars over the last 10 years, when they come to us and they ask for money, they talk about the services they provide. And without exception, both every organization that has come to us, what they say is the gateway drug is marijuana. That's where everybody starts. So I think that's something we need to think about. Is that where we want? It's not where I want my grandkids to start. That's the reason we moved here. I think Aurora is going to have six dispensaries. North Aurora, I go by that frequently down on Route 31. There's going to be ample opportunity for people to purchase their cannabis. I just don't think we need to join the crowd. And if the primary motivating factor for it is revenue, I'll offer my services. Revenue is a challenge for local government, and maybe we need to look at raising revenue or cutting expenses. I've been in the game. I was Tom Weisner's chief of staff, de facto village manager for several years. Um, I just think you've got a heavy decision to make. Don't make it lightly, and I am dead against it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, Eleanor Fiasconi, 50 Willie Lane, Batavia. It's all about money. Examine your conscience. Why do you want a dispensary in Batavia? That's what I ask. It's more than that. You don't need to think of the financial part of it. Think of the people in Batavia. We don't need a dispensary. They will find it. They will buy it. Think about it. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Bob Spence. I just retired um, after about 38 years of public service. First as an assistant state's attorney for about 20 years and then as a judge for the last 18 years. I've seen lots and lots of cases that were affected by drug usage. I'm not here to talk about whether it's a good idea or bad idea to legalize it. That's done. That's over. What I am here to say is I've lived in Matavia for 37 years. It's a great community. A lot of that is because of the leadership of Jeff Schalke and the city council. I appreciate what you guys do. I appreciate the weight of this decision. I would encourage you to read the statute that permits this. Because one of the things I just found out, I should have read this a long time ago. I hadn't read it. What I recently found out is something about what we're inviting into the community if this goes forward. One of those things is this. Because this has been defined as a social justice issue, priority is given when people are applying for a license. Priority is given to those people 
who have criminal convictions. Now, just think about that for a minute. This, this law has not been well thought out, but it is the law. It, it's what we have, okay? So just think about that for a minute. Priority is given, and the statute says this in black and white. Read the statute. This is what it says. Priority is given to those who have criminal convictions. So we're inviting convicted felons into the community to set up shop. Just think about that for a few minutes, whether that's necessary or advisable. And then the second thing is, <clears throat> this has been legalized since January 1st. It's a cash business. Because right now, the federal laws prohibit banking, using banks for this kind of money, for the money gained from this activity, because it's, it violates federal statutes. Still. So while it's legal here, it is not legal federally. So you can't use the banks. So it's a cash business, right? So six days after it's legalized, there is a pot shop in Logan Square. It's burglarized. $100,000 is taken. So look at what else you're inviting into the community. You're inviting, we're just inviting a lot of things into the community that we don't need. And it's not advisable. And it's not necessary. And, you know, I don't question anybody's desire to do this. If people want to do this, I mean, do it in your home and fine. Whatever. I, that doesn't concern me at all. But this, do, this decision, if you, if you say no on this, it doesn't affect anybody's ability to obtain it. Nobody. The, the shop down in Aurora is 3.9 miles away. Is that too hard to drive to? It's 3.9 miles. If there's one in St. Charles, St. Charles has approved it, it's five miles. It's not too far. Thank you for your time. Thanks for your consideration. I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name's uh, Kim Howland. And I just wanted to um, bring up some points with um, regards to things to think about as well um, in terms of considering the use of um, the uh, marijuana here in Batavia and the selling of marijuana here in Batavia. While there are um, potential tax benefits, um, I was, would like us to consider some of the real costs to our city and our state. Um, we can begin by looking at some places where legalization is well underway and the cost to those states and, and the uh, municipalities um, related to legal, implica um, excuse me, legal implications. Um, as medical marijuana use is continuing um, to spread um, throughout um, the various states, the state of Michigan, for example, um, they are, are facing a number of lawsuits. The reasons for these lawsuits vary widely. Um, and muni municipalities um, are being sued uh, many times by disgruntled um, marijuana dispensary operators who were forced to close due to regulatory changes within that state. Um, and since this is an industry where um, there's a lot of flux right now, um, there are many municipalities across the country that are fearful of making the wrong move after they've legalized it and invoking a lawsuit. Um, Troy, Lansing, and Detroit have all faced lawsuits for such actions, um, including um, there's been arguments and, and lawsuits over the buffer zones for where the placement of these shops are located. And there's also been lawsuits over changing the way that the permits are awarded. Um, also with the uh, long-term um, efficacy of medical marijuana remains to be seen. There's also a cost of medical marijuana for employers, which can be astronomical. In states with um, medical marijuana laws, Social Security disability insurance claims have risen 9.9% post-legalization. There has also been an increase in employees using or attempting to use marijuana on the job. Uh, while typically courts have been in favor of employers' rights, 2017 saw multiple courts across the country rule in favor of employees who had taken employers to court over marijuana use in the workplace. Em employers who chose to settle 
marijuana related cases outside of course outside of court rather face costs of ninety thousand dollars on average um, with employers choosing to allow um, cases to go uh, to court they face an average of around one hundred and sixty five thousand uh, dollars per case um, it's important to note that almost 25 percent of the cases that go to court for judgment cost defendants an average of five hundred thousand dollars so we're talking some very, very, very expensive costs to employers and small businesses um, that uh, due to um, use of medical or use of marijuana by, by employees. And that's regardless of whether or not they have policies for it. Um, it just is happening. Um, there are also um, increased costs that the insurance industry is looking quite closely at because as we all know, insurance companies have to look at what it is um, they they need uh, to uh, have on their books as far as actuaries and uh, numbers and what are the real costs and how that is going to in fact affect our costs <clears throat> and just from that aspect alone um, the insurance um, industry has noted um, as of right now in trying to consider uh, what the risks are, that there are some real risks. There's real medical risks. There's risks in terms of cancers. Uh, they've determined that um, medical marijuana is um, responsible for an increase in problems related to schizophrenia, increased social anxiety disorders. Um, there's um, indication that it may be linked to suicidal thoughts and increase in symptoms for bipolar. All these things have ramifications. And when you have insurance companies who there's money on the line, and this is the kind of um, research, uh, research that they are doing to determine what they need to charge in, in terms of their insurance uh, premiums and whatnot. Um, there's cognitive effects as well, memory, attention, impairment that they've determined, um, and um, the list goes on and on in terms of the, um, the medical implications. Um, I'll close with this, that just as of yesterday, the Chicago Tribune ran an article um, where the, the article was entitled, Chicago Hospitals Brace for More Weed-Related Visits. Illinois Poison Control Center already fielding more cases, some involving kids. The article stated that the University of Illinois Hospital had already seen an increase of cannabis-related visits since January 1. Most patients have complained of symptoms, including restlessness, racing hearts, anxiety. And while these symptoms are more mild, Dr. Uh, Thompson, who is an associate professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology, said that some of the patients have uh, reported more severe symptoms, including hallucinations and psychosis. He went on to say that many believe that it is not possible to overdose on cannabis, but that is incorrect. And people don't realize that it takes time for edibles um, to kick in, and so they consume more of it. Um, the Illinois Poison Control Center had fielded questions um, about 11 cases involving marijuana between January 1 and January 12, um, compared with four calls um, at the same time last year. And three of these cases involved small children who accidentally ingested edibles. Um, and the rest were related to adolescents or adults. Uh, as a former, as a as somebody who has worked in the field of education uh, for more than 25 years, uh, that is really concerning to think that um, the youth could get a hold of this even um, accidentally. Uh, so these are just some uh, considerations. Um, and there's also reports of increased violent crime. You can look that up in, in places where, um, and especially homicide, I should say, in um, states where um, marijuana has been um, legalized and used. So that's an increased cost as well in terms of our manpower and our police. And uh, it, in fact, could you know, potentially cost lives, which is really the most important thing. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thanks, Kim, for all that objective data. My name is Christina Anderson. I have over 25 years in the safety and health uh, business. I work now for an insurance agency with over 2,000 clients, and I can tell you this is of huge concern. Uh, so some additional facts that I'd like to point out. The National Drug Survey, or National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, is the largest substance abuse and mental health um, survey. Uh, the data I have is from 2016. That's the most recent that was available online. There were close to 68,000 respondents. These respondents were 12 years old or older. Uh, but again, it provides the most accurate estimates of drug, alcohol, and tobacco use in the US general population. Maybe you didn't know this, but most illegal drug users are employed. 13.4 uh, million drug users are employed. 8.8% of them are full-time employees. 9.4% part-time uh, employees are drug users. 10.2 million people drive under the influence of illicit drugs. Uh, when these individuals arrive at work, they don't leave their problems at the door. They take them with them into the workplace. 10 to 20% of the nation's workers who die on the job test positive for uh, drugs or alcohol use. Those that use alcohol or drugs are 10 times more likely to miss work, 3.6 times more likely to be involved in on-the-job accidents, and five times more likely to injure themselves or others in the accident. They are five times more likely to file a workers' compensation claim, 33% less productive, and three times increase in health care costs. I held a webinar back in October for clients to talk about the CRTA and the potential impacts it could have on businesses. We had 100 people attend that webinar. Again, there's huge concern out there among businesses. Since that time, I have spent countless hours working with clients on writing programs, training uh, supervisors on reasonable suspicion, and training employees in their employer's workplace policies. There's also the impact on businesses surrounding um, these dispensaries. Here's one example of uh, an email that we received on January 8th, right? Just days after this uh, went into effect. Um, Happy New Year, hope all is well. Our next door neighbor is a dispensary. Sorry, I'm getting old, I have to put on my glasses. Uh, and the recreational era has sparked considerable increase in traffic in this area. People often park in our lot, especially when we're not here, and folks waiting in line often spill onto our property. And the uh, email goes on to ask for help in um, how to uh, combat this. Um, I have driven past the North Aurora Dispensary multiple times, and I see that there are two police officers uh, on duty there uh, every time I've driven by. So for whatever the potential uh, taxes and, and revenue coming in are, uh, which if it's only 3%, I would consider that to be negligible, um, you're going to have a huge increase in costs. Uh, to also um, add some objective data, consider Colorado. There was a 66% increase in pot-related traffic deaths, 72% increase in pot-related hospitalizations from marijuana-induced psychosis, um, a quote from uh, The Hill, uh, marijuana cases have increased threefold at UC Health University of Colorado Hospital emergency room since 2014. Denver Hospital saw three times more marijuana-related ER visits after legalization. Um, uh, something from an article, is cannabis really more potent today than it was 20 years ago by Sean Miller, uh, dated September 20th, 2017. If you do a quick survey of marijuana potency in any given rec shop now, and most strains will be somewhere close to 20%, some high potency strains pushing upwards of 30% THC. So this isn't the marijuana that Cheech and Chong smoked. Um, 
homelessness has skyrocketed skyrocketed and Colorado youth are number one in the nation for this past month. Uh, I myself was in California back in May and we stopped at a coffee shop. We're sitting in the parking lot and there was an older teen. Um, I don't think they were quite 21, uh, but they were walking with someone who was clearly middle school aged, maybe even a little bit younger and both smoking pot. So huge concern for our youth as well. Um, so what I would ask is, why did Naperville give a hard and fast no? All right, I don't know if anyone has looked into that, but what are the reasons they gave a hard and fast no, not here? So I think we should at least do some more research and, and find that out. Um, I am all for the suggestion to put this to the people on using a referendum, um, but I absolutely do not think that enough time has passed to determine what the pros and cons of, of this are. So thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next. My name's Robert Wozniak. I live at 936 Lund Lane. I've been a resident here for 29 years. Uh, I dropped copies of the letter I wrote to Senator Oberweiss on most of your places. I didn't have one for each. Maybe you've seen it, or maybe you've read it, or maybe you just use it for scribble paper. Uh, my problem with, with this, first of all, the only reason I can see any of you being in favor of this, unless you're potheads already, or users, <laughs> the only reason I can see you being in favor is the extra income, 3%, like the lady said. Uh, and because it all sound, it doesn't sound so bad when you put recreational in front of it. I mean, a recreational uh, cannabis dispensary, that doesn't sound bad. Uh, what about recreational addictive drug dealers? I mean, let's call it what it is. And you're going to be catching the kids more than anything else. You, we must have some experience in this town already with vaping and the problems with vaping. I know Geneva and St. Charles do because I was at a meeting at, uh, in St. Charles uh, several months ago where the two mayors said our big problem is vaping. And these are not kids that are, are old enough to use, the, use uh, to be vaping. And they flavor it. Uh, if, and if you're looking, you're looking at uh, a, a gateway drug, like people said, uh, the next gate, next, next gate is what? Uh, opioids, or cocaine. Uh, but that's bad unless you throw recreational in front of it. So now we'll have recreational opioids. And that solves our opioid problem because now you can collect taxes on it. This, this, is, not, this is not right. Uh, I, I suggested what about recreational prostitution? Sorry, Father. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're looking for money, I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of vices you can, you can start taxing or selling permits for. Uh, bank robbery, murder, pedophiles. Sell, sell a license and then licensing people. I mean, the money's not worth it, folks. Your kids are more important, or your grandkids, or maybe you yourself. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. Hi, good evening. My name is Christopher Howland, and i am uh, been a resident of Batavia now for almost 20 years. I grew up in Aurora um, and um, always knew Batavia to be an upstanding community, some uh, community where its leaders cared greatly for the success of all its citizens. And um, I... Uh, love the fact that we're here um, in an open forum to provide you with information to make an educated decision because this is a critical decision um, for our community and it could really change the direction that Batavia and trajectory that Batavia has been on for the last almost 200 years um, and I'd ask you to think very deeply um, as you consider some of the evidence and I've heard uh, very eloquently a lot of uh, my fellow citizens 
uh, talk about uh, bits of evidence. Um, you know, we this was the Wild West what, in 2013. We now have almost seven years of data uh, on the experience of the Western states that moved very early to legalize, and I'll just call it marijuana, you know, the uh, tobacco industry. <coughs> Um, specifically renamed it cannabis because after market testing they felt that it uh, imparted a medical technical term that uh, would uh, remove um, some of the uh, prior uh, thinking about the term marijuana. Um, but let me draw to your attention and then I'll ask uh, perhaps if I can enter it into the evidence um, so that the community is aware that you all had this information prior to making your decisions, um, because I think it's that critical. And this information arises uh, directly from CMS, uh, Central Medicare, Medicare and Medical Services, specifically their subcommittee on um, the high intensity drug trafficking areas um, or what was called the Midwest HITA, or High Intensity Drug Traffic Areas. And it was commissioned by the federal government uh, directly by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And what it does is it compiles uh, the, I think, five to six states that together um, uh, offer us some insight as to what really happens in uh, state and local municipal communities after legalization. And uh, in the 15 minutes since uh, my wife told me this afternoon that this was occurring, um, I was able to jump on Google Scholar and pull up about 20 articles, including this one, um, that uh, offer a, a tremendous amount of information that brings together all of these experiences that the citizens have shared with you. So let me just jump through a couple things. And, you know, I, we talked about the 3% revenue as being a potential positive um, for the community. Um, that 3% revenue and uh, the taxing revenues that are even much, much higher in some of the states uh, that have already legalized um, have... Uh, uh, nowhere near come close to the negative cost impacts uh, of uh, legalizing and normalizing the currently Schedule One drug, marijuana. As a matter of fact, for every tax dollar brought in across those surveyed states, the local government expended $4.25 in mitigated auxiliary help um, for the damages that had been caused. Some of them soft metrics, others hard metrics. But let me just read you a few of those um, metrics, and then I, I will, I'll make sure that everyone has this study so you can go through it on your own. Hospitalizations, treatment for cannabis use disorder, burn treatments, low birth weight babies, Cost of physical inactivity, cost for businesses of policy development, cost to employers for rehabilitation programming, employees' cost for rehab. And here's one that I just, I, I, I cannot believe that our community would allow this. And that is a significant increase in K-12 educational dropouts. That is not what Batavia represents. My 10-year-old son is here tonight because he wanted to see um, government in action, and he's getting a good look. Arrests, DUI court costs, juvenile court filings, adult court filings, um, Denver-related, marijuana-related crime. Um, Denver had such big issues that they, they broke some of that out. Um, probationers going back um, on a, going back into prison for THC subsequent violations, fatal car accidents, DUIs, car accidents from marijuana impaired drivers, evictions due to cannabis leading to homelessness in these communities, 
and arrests for people crossing the border into Colorado and then crossing the state line again with uh, uh, marijuana, bringing it into states where it is not currently legal. And that offset, uh, the tax revenue, you know, these are the positives. A, a couple communities saw very slight increases in the uh, local areas, uh, real estate appraisal values. Why? Because those were already socioeconomically blighted uh, problem areas. And uh, when, the, um, when the dispensaries moved into those areas, a lot of those people sold their property, rezoned it, and uh, put up parking lots uh, for the problems we heard tonight. I, I often go down Route 31 to get on the tollway in the morning, and I see down by Harner's Bakery, they have a huge problem. Um, all the businesses have local security uh, ensuring that uh, their customers have access to park to go into Harner's even. And um, this is a, a, a problem that has already ensued in the first, what, 15 days um, in uh, the next contingent community. So I would ask you to consider this evidence and make an educated decision before we jump into this, this is a wonderful community, and you've all contributed, everyone here has contributed to it, and I know that uh, many of the citizens would love to see it stay that way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Good evening, my name is Lois Dahlstrom and I live at 419 South Forest Avenue, Batavia. I've emailed you all recently in the last few months over this issue and previously to that about the issue of video gambling. I'm not afraid to speak up. Once again, I come before you with a plea for not changing our city zoning laws to allow for the sale of recreational marijuana. Although the sale of the drug is allowed by law throughout our state, you have the opportunity and the responsibility just to say no on it in, as an inroad into our community. The harmful effects of marijuana has long been documented and people in the, within this room can testify to the harm of it in their own lives as well as in the lives of their family members. The statistics have been quoted here for, about Colorado, Michigan, Washington, and other places where it's been legalized. Um, and allowed to be used. Don't doubt that those same problems will appear here in our community, within our borders, if you approve the changes in our zoning laws. Don't get caught up with the idea of tax revenue profit that the businesses could bring into Batavia. Resist the temptation to follow the municip municipalities <coughs> up and down the Fox River. You can put a dollar value on the loss of, you cannot put the, a dollar value on the loss of lives to drugs. Take a stand with Mayor Schelke and oppose shops that sell pot in our city. Vote to oppose any zoning changes concerning the commercialization of the sale of marijuana within the Batavia city limits. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kirk Van Nord. I live at uh, 861 Brown Court in Batavia. Um, my family moved to Batavia in 1991 and I've lived in Batavia most of my life, uh, but I moved back in 2018 and I own a home here in Batavia. Um, thank you for the opportunity though to, you know, just I, I guess shed some light on the opportunity, uh, on the, uh, you know, the thing that we need to make a decision on here today. Um, as I feel like it's a very relevant issue and, um, you know, although we may not all agree on it, I think that um, uh, at the same time, uh, we, we're, we all have a commitment to doing what's, not only doing things right, but doing the right thing. And um, I consider it pure joy that, you know, um, as a resident of Batavia, you know, this is a city that's committed to educational excellence. Um, I think that uh, we always have been very com committed to education and innovation runs thick in our veins. 
Um, one thing I've always been a very big fan of ever since I was in middle school is the uh, Fox Valley uh, Lego Robotics competition, which has gone on since 2002. Um, I was actually involved in the first um, the first competition uh, at Rotola Middle School, and I hold my hand here a picture of myself when I was in eighth grade. I was 13 years old, and um, that was made possible by a $4,000 grant from the Batavia Foundation for Educational Excellence. And um, I urge you not to just look at it from, to be tempted to look at the issue from being clouded by misinformation and fear mongering and potential threats. And I also don't appreciate, um, you know, think bad things being said about our educational system here in Batavia because I've always been a big fan of it. And I think that we do a commendable job and several of your teachers here and uh, like, Thank you all for everything you've done. Um, but I do feel that, you know, this, as I mentioned, was made possible by a $4,000 grant from the Batavia Foundation for Educational Excellence. And if we're able to capitalize on a potential opportunity that could bring in tax revenue towards things like this, it could actually increase um, what we're able to do within our school system and put more money towards innovation challenges. You know, this set the direction for the course of my life because it empowered a socially awkward and somewhat quirky 13-year-old kid <laughs> and allowed him to create something of his own. And 18 years later, I'm leading innovation tournaments in my field. So um, that being said, I feel like there, you know, as a, as a homeowner in Batavia, the two biggest issues that I've run into at least, or that, that concern me the most from a financial perspective are the cost of utilities, which we addressed earlier. Um, and actually, my, my house is near the, the sidewalk there, uh, talking about building two, which is near AGS. Um, but the second issue is taxes, and you know, we have an election year coming up. There's a lot of financial headwinds, political headwinds uh, coming up as well that I think are very relevant. So, from that perspective, I mean, yes, we, you know, the surrounding towns are all selling, you know, cannabis from their respective dispensaries. Um, it's a very close drive. I'm not necessarily recommending that we put a dispensary right in downtown Batavia, but if we had something, perhaps through the zoning commission that allowed it on the outskirts of Batavia where we were able to benefit from tax revenue that we could put towards education as well as law enforcement so that we could better address violent crimes and other relevant crimes. Um, I think that would be worth looking <coughs> into. So therefore, I urge you not to rush into a quick decision, but consider this um, as I feel like, you know, there are a lot of different things to consider. Um, I've also talked about this with the pastor of my church. Um, he essentially said that if, as long as they're complying with the laws of the state and, you know, things are being done ethically and legally, um, then there's really not a problem. Um, so that's my perspective on it. Um, I'm also looking into being a youth leader within my church. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, education is in healthcare, both, you know, causes that are very dear to my heart. And I feel that um, rather than just running off a bunch of statistics, like I said, I wanted to, I only brought one copy, but I can, you know, you guys can pass this around if you'd like, but this was... Just give it up there when you're ready. Okay, I'll, I'll pass this around in just a minute before beforehand, but I just, like I said, um, I appreciate Batavia, and I think that this issue is not necessarily a question of if it's going to be uh, allowed uh, in terms of recreational sales. It's more of a question of when, and as long as we have a, a sound business plan, a clear engagement strategy, and an end in mind, that this would be worth looking into because it could produce potential tax revenues that could increase the rankings of our schools within the state, uh, rather than seeing the towns around us put more money towards education from the tax revenue that they generate. Um, thank you for your time, and I look forward to uh, further discussions. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, city clerk up there. Her yeah. second move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Priscilla Carr, and I live here in Batavia. I actually had some information I wanted to share from you, but I felt like there was so many other um, good statistics that were already shared um, about I am not in favor of having a, um, I'm not even gonna say it right, depository here, is that right? Dispensary. Dispensary, sorry, that was, I probably should have read my thing, I had it on there. Um, but I am a mother of five, and um, I love my kids. I want the very best for them. I want them to be able to do well in life, and to be honest with you, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is my end result. That's what I hope for and I pray for for my children. But I want a very safe, good place for them to live as well. And um, this is a very big decision for you all. And 
I hope that you all um, think about this decision that you are going to make that is going to affect many, many lives. And I can't help but think about the fact that marijuana has been sold you know, for, for years and years and years, but it has not been readily available. And now that it is legalized, younger kids are going to get it in their hands and in their mouths and in their bodies. And it is going to take the lives of some kids. And that is very real. Also, more people are going to get addicted to this. And it is going to end some lives. So we really need to be sober about this and think about the ramifications of the decision that is going to be made. Um, I also, sorry, my husband had to leave. Um, he is a pastor, but he had to go take care of um, my kids. But he's been in the, in the, he handed this to me before he left because he didn't have an opportunity to uh, talk before he went. Um, he's been in the Air Force. He's an Air Force chaplain for 32 years um, in the reserves. And he's been a pastor in the area for 20 years. And now he currently works with the North Aurora uh, Police Department. He's a chaplain there that he volunteers for. Um, and he needs wisdom in these roles. And you are sitting in your seats of responsibility. He prays that you will make a wise decision based on what you know and what you have heard as well. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you all listening very much. I wanted to, to say that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Dan Erickson. I live in the third ward. I almost lost my son to drugs. And it started in Batavia High School. He started on pot. It took a lot of money and a lot of prayers to get him off. This is irresponsible to make it easier to get marijuana in this town. You've already had a problem at the high school. Fix that, but don't make it so much easier for them to get it in our town. It's crazy. This is absolutely crazy. The benefits, the right. Everybody that's up here that's spoken before, they're absolutely right. I've been to Denver. I see the homelessness on the streets. I see the, the pot shops up and down. It's a, it's a pit. And it's become even more of a pit because of the legalization of marijuana in that town. It is, to, for anybody to sit there and think that marijuana is not harmful and is recreational. There's nothing recreational about losing a person to it. Think about that. Really think about it. Because it almost cost my son his life. Thank you for letting me speak. I hang my head low because of the gentleman that just spoke. I had the pleasure to speak to the mayor. And um, I heard that there were seven citizens of Batavia that overdosed. One on Christmas Eve. I'm not sure if this gentleman was one of the seven or this gentleman's children. I normally don't tell you what I did because right now, politically, um, I've got an X on my back. But I spent many, t many months, years, several months at the borders, Brownsville, El Paso, San Ysidro. San Ysidro, we call it Skid Row. When I was there, it was 26 lanes coming in. I call it Disneyland on steroids. You just have to go see that place. 
When I was there, I was young, three years on the job. There's more drugs coming in through Mexico than any other country. 100% we think of marijuana, 90% cocaine. Those seven true Christ-loving people that died, their gateway was marijuana. I can't believe you're even in introducing this to our city. I love this city. I've been here for 20 years. It's beautiful. It's not like Geneva or St. Charles. It's quaint. I've seen the ruthlessness, vicious, just vicious cartel. They stop at nothing. I've got stories to tell you, but I can't write them down and tell you. I wish more officers, customs officers, would be speaking to you about what's happening. But no, we're not allowed to talk. But in this city, I'm speaking up. I'm standing here. Hope, faith, and love. The greatest of these is love. But I hope that you will make the right choice. I've seen containers, I've seen planefuls coming in the country. We can't stop it because of the, the people here that just, they say entertainment. Recreation? Recreation marijuana? Would you call it recreation? You go see the borders. You go into Mexico. You go see Cali. You go to Colombia. You go to a lot of those Central and South American countries, and let's see what happens. They're killing law enforcement there in Mexico. They're killing reporters that report the truth about the cartel. They don't list the amount of people getting killed in Mexico. Just research it. I know it's legal, but have you read or researched how the governor actually didn't look at the report that the state police wanted to give him? Don't be like him. Don't just sign off on the, on the, on the law. And think about it and vote no. Stand up. I want you, if you vote yes to this, if you're thinking of yes, I want you to stand in front of those seven children that died from overdoses. What will you tell the family? The mayor cried with them. What are you gonna do? Do the right thing. My wife and I have, are on the hit list for ISIS. An FBI agent came to our house and Batavia police came to our house. What I did for 32 years was very important. Our swing towards terrorism is really letting up with the drugs. So I don't want that to happen here in Batavia. I want to walk down the street without a line, without traffic, and who knows what they're going to do. You've, I've heard stories, two stories. One woman had gummy bears. She took three. She didn't think that was enough. She took three more. Then she took two or three more. She ended up uh, uh, on the ground. They had a reviver. So that was just a woman with gummy bears. <clears throat> then there was a guy at the golf course. Uh, apparently, golf courses are really big with smoking dope. And he was smoking and then he drank. So drinking alcohol and smoking affects you more. You ran into his neighbor's garage. 
gets out and he says, oh, I'll take care of it later. He goes into his house and he starts throwing things around. So alcohol and drugs don't mix, especially the marijuana that they're selling now. So I don't know if you know these stories, but they should be told. But um, I just pray. I, I want to do a Tim Tebow, but I really want to go even further. Both my knees have to be on the ground right now. And I pray that you make the right decision for all of us, for me, for you, our citizens. I pray, I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, please. Thank you. Can we get your name for the record, sir? Ken Singer. Sorry. Thank you. Next. Good evening. Uh, my name is Larry Stratton. My wife and I uh, live on Iroquois Drive. We've been here in Batavia for 32 years. I just want to say I appreciate all of you and the time that you're putting into this. And I know that it's a pretty serious decision that none of you are taking it lightly. Uh, I'll, I'll just be brief. I think that uh, as I've heard the kind of the argument for, uh, one, it seems to be absent of, hey, this is really good for our city. I've, I've not really heard anybody say, this is really good for our city. But what I have heard, and I appreciate your pragmatism on this, is that all of these bad things that we're hearing that are going to happen, they're already happening because people around us have said yes. And so why wouldn't we take advantage of the tax revenue when those bad things are going to happen anyhow? So pragmatically, we should get our piece of the pie so that our Batavia citizens don't have to have taxes that are higher. And I appreciate that logic and that 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 decision, uh, and I feel like as a Batavia resident, you uh, are trying to protect me from having higher taxes and complaining about that. Um, I would just say, don't worry about it. I'm okay if my taxes go up. <laughs> I don't want to live yeah. in a town that has dispensaries when you can go this way and that way and get what you need if you need it. But I don't want my grandkids or my neighbor kids or anybody else to, to go from, yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's probably not good to, that's right down the street. And I know so many people that are now doing it, it's become acceptable. And yeah, you know, the argument that alcohol is here and people abuse it and it's, I don't understand that logic. Like, there's stuff that's not working, so why don't we add other stuff that's not working? That really makes sense. And secondly, I would just urge you guys, um, I know of other towns where the citizens have come out and done what the citizens have done tonight and given facts and given really logical arguments and pleaded and said, don't do this. And the city councils were, it, the, it was a done deal before the meeting ever happened. And I, I hope that's not the case here with all of you. I trust that it's, that it's not, that you're listening to what's being said and, and what the citizens of Batavia want. And if, and if you don't believe that the overwhelming majority don't really want this, then put it on a referendum and find out. But, um, and I don't say this facetiously, I appreciate that you're trying to protect the financial responsibility here of our city. I've always appreciated that for 32 years. And our city's gotten better and better and better. Let's don't go the other way. Let's just don't go the other way and say, you know what? Because that side of the wall crumbled and this side of the wall crumbled, guess what? Our side of the wall, we might as well crumble because we're all going to end up down here and it's just all going to be, so we need to get our peace. No, let's don't. Let's don't let our side of the wall crumble. Let's have this be a place where people can come and, and people can feel like this is, this is my town and these guys protect me in this way. Thank you very much. Anybody else? <clears throat> my name's uh, Jake Chigrew. Uh, 
Uh, I've been in Batavia for five years now. Uh, I'm pro dispensary uh, in Batavia. And uh, interesting point made by the last gentleman, um, you know, is that this is happening. I mean, this is on 31, Verilife. You can go there. It's three miles away. Uh, St. Charles has voted, you know, yes. Or, you know, th this is happening. Cannabis is going to be in our community. Cannabis is already in our community. Um, to think that um, children can't get marijuana um, within 10 minutes is, it's naive. It's here. Uh, kids can get it. Kids right now uh, largely get unregulated uh, marijuana with, you know, God knows what in it. Um, you know, speaking to just the business of this, um, you know, if there are increased costs of, uh, from a law enforcement standpoint or regulatory standpoint, um, you know, I don't want to share that cost burden. Um, you know, that because North Aurora has said yes, St. Charles has said yes, other surrounding towns have said yes. Um, I would like to see a dispensary in Batavia. I would like to reap the tax benefits of that. I would like to know exactly where those tax benefits are going within our community. I think a level of transparency um, as to where those tax benefits, you know, those taxes are going is important. I think um, today in today's society, especially in Illinois, um, citizens feel that, you know, okay, Spending is reckless within our government here, um, and we don't know where all these tax dollars go. We don't see a direct, um, this is where our tax money is spent. Um, with this issue, I think it's very important, if Batavia is to have uh, a dispensary to vote yes to it, I think it's very important that there's a level of transparency maintained. I think it's very important that it goes into um, law enforcement, our school systems, uh, and you know, key areas like that where people can see um, a difference and that we can hedge the cost uh, of North Aurora's already decision and St. Charles. Um, I'm pro, pro, I uh, just want to make that very clear. Um, yeah, thank you for listening, thank you for your time. And I respect everybody, um, you know, everybody has their opinions, I respect everybody has their opinions. Um, I have mine, you have yours, uh, I'm a citizen of this community, we're all neighbors. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody coming out, um, and I appreciate the dedication um, to Speak what Speak into the microphone, please. I appreciate the dedication to what everybody believes uh, here. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. Sorry, you thought you were done, right? <laughs> um, I'm Bob Kikeffer. Uh, I live in the Windermere subdivision in the seventh ward. Um, the last two gentlemen, I think, really put their finger on the, on the real question before this body. And, you know, I, I feel the pain and, and, and I really honor the, the spirit of the gentleman who spoke with such passion before. But the issue is not whether marijuana is good or whether marijuana is bad, whether it's, a, it's morally right or morally wrong. Uh, that decision was made for us by our state legislature. And I agree with the judge that they did a pretty poor job when they did it. Uh, a lot of the way that the law is written is, is pretty sloppy. But the fact is, it's legal. And so that's not the issue before this body. Is the issue before this body then, should Batavia participate in the distribution of marijuana? Or is the issue that, that should, should Batavia participate at all in the fact that marijuana is legal? And as the last two gentlemen have said, we're going to experience the effects of legalization of marijuana, whether it was sold within our borders or not. Um, it's going to affect law enforcement, it's going to affect our ambulance service, our hospitals, um, our social services, our courts. So the question is, do we want to pay for those costs through general taxes or do we want to take advantage of the opportunity to offset some of those costs by participating in the sale of marijuana? The, the two gentlemen before me, one is for and one of them is against. And since I appear to be the last speaker, I'll tell you, I don't know yet whether I think it's the right thing or not. I've, I've talked to several of you. I've talked to the mayor. Um, but I would, I would just urge you, as you think about this, don't think about evils of marijuana. Don't think about all the horrible things that it can cause in the community, the lives that it can affect. Talk to your legislators about that. Think about how it's going to affect Batavia and how we want to respond to that. 
Uh, I'm not going to say yes or no. I'm not going to vote against either for either of you gentlemen, no matter how you vote. Um, and I don't envy you having to make the decision. And I do appreciate uh, all the attention you paid tonight. It's, it's good when we can all listen to each other, try to understand each other's positions, and realize that when you come to a decision like this, a lot of people are going to be unhappy. And probably the unhappiness will be more extreme on the part of the people who don't want this than it would be on the people, part of the people who do. But that's, that's up for you to decide. So thanks, and now we get to hear from you, right? Thank you. Does anybody else want to talk? Over here. <laughs> uh, thank you again uh, for letting us uh, speak. Uh, my name is Antonio Del Real, and uh, I live in 321 North of Uren. Uh, what I'm about to share with you guys is not a statistic, it's a real story. Um, and this is stories of kids that I work with. Um, and this happened about a week ago of a kid that um, there was a student at the school that I work at and basically got involved in marijuana and then marijuana led to something different and a bigger drug. This kid not only started with marijuana and experienced other drugs, but ended up in jail, ended up in uh, a rehabilitation center for three years. And when I talked to him, one of the first things that he shared with me was you know, I wish I would have listened to you when I was in high school and everything that you got to share with me and all the experiences that you would tell me about how my friends were never going to be there and the only people that were going to be there was my family. And he said, I wish I could turn back time and go back. And, and those are the type of stories that I don't want to hear, especially happening in the town that I live in. I want to be able to walk in downtown Batavia without having to experience any of that. Okay, um, some of the other things is that um, if you ever been or work at a school where you have to call a parent to meet you at the emergency room because their son or their daughter had overdose in a bathroom at a school, it, it's not a fun thing to do. And I wish you would consider something like that when you make a decision to bring something like that into our town. Because uh, again, working with youth is something that I have a passion for, and I would do anything to protect them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There's nobody else. We'll move into uh, our little circle up here, and we'll get to discuss this a little bit. Not to put anybody on the spot, but would anybody like to start? I'll go. Marty? So I appreciate those of you that kind of uh, had the personal stories and the backgrounds. Um, and here's my statement, I am proud of it. Um, I was in law enforcement down on the border with a Haida area straight out of El Paso. I brought tonight, here is my book when I was a detective of all of the crimes that occur because of that. I have worked every type of, as was said, debauchery that the human condition can take on each other. With that said, a gentleman posed the question, no, I don't smoke, but there are other reasons why we would consider it. I don't give a lick about the dollar portion of it. I don't. As was said about the practicality of what the state did, that they decided this for our state. So we are left to deal with it. It is in the community whether we like it or not. As a practical matter of it, how do you protect our residents from what is going on that which already exists? A way to do that is to regulate the sale of it so that people know what they're buying, people know what is in it, the contents of it, and everything that goes along with it. We are not going to stop illegal back alley, back alley sales. 
But the more that we have the opportunity to educate people about what they're consuming and the potential dangers because of it, that's the rational, morally responsible thing that we should be doing, which is to look out for those people that are trying to make informed decisions. Education was also discussed about this tonight. What that entails is also knowing what you're consuming and what you're not consuming. If we leave it to just people going into other alleys in a cash business, there's potential for crime right there. Are we condoning that? Are we turning our blind eye to people based on moral judgments that we're leaving them to the wolves? Or do we figure out ways to make sure we know where this is going, how it's being sold, where it's being sold, where we know the monitoring can be done by the law enforcement. When it's above board and transparent, you have an idea. If you don't, those, those overdoses that people are talking about, there's no dispensary in town, so why did we have them? Why did it happen already? Because nobody knew what they were buying. Nobody knew how much to take. The concern that we have about the edibles is nobody knows what's in them. Nobody knows what's in there and how many to take. And if people start taking them 20 minutes from here or 10 minutes from here, then it kicks in when they hit our border. It's our problem with the DUI. Why would we want our citizens to fend for themselves in other communities and bring the potential issues back to our community where we have no idea what they bought, where they bought it, when they bought it, how they bought it? Those are the things that, from a practical matter, there are reasons why we would think about regulating it. Okay. Next. Mike? Well, we, we, you know, our government, I think here in Batavia, we have a transparent government. We, we work hard putting a budget together. And, and, you know, if you sit through these budget meetings we have, the discussions go on forever. And, and what came of it is, you know, we, we fought real hard to raise no taxes. And there's a lot of discussion that went on back and forth. And, uh, here in Batavia, you know, we, we need to generate revenue for quality of life for the people in Batavia. But from the, the onset when this question came up, I, I, I was thinking of just the money part of that, and that, you know, we, we have to generate revenue, we need to find sources of revenue. But, but just with the, the research and the reading and the, the discussions I've been having with people, I'm, I'm, I'm just finding out, and I don't really care what adult, what they do with their lives. They drink, they smoke, whatever it is they do, they're adults. That is on them. But, but our youth today is, is being inundated with this stuff. And, you know, years ago, when you went to, to school, for me it was an eternity ago. But when people got high, you know, it was, it was pretty innocent stuff. You know, like vaping today, what... What they're, they're putting into this stuff, what chemicals they're putting into the vaping is killing people, is killing kids. It, it, it's, it's rendering them through all kinds of disabilities. And it's, it's the same stuff that's going into the, the, the cannabis, I believe. I mean, even if it is regulated, we don't know still what, what effects they're having. But we do know that, you know, there, there are a lot of psychotic reactions from this. And I, I'm, I'm a definite no vote, and I'm a hard no vote on this, because I think we're, we're really putting, as, as much as we need the money here in Batavia, we need the revenues, uh, this is a poor source for this. I, I don't think myself or the, the residents in Batavia want to, want to condone or, or be a contribute to, to this, this, this psychotic behavior to our children any, any further. So... That, that, is, that would be my, my end all, is just what are we doing to our children? And, and I have some personal knowledge of, 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 of a child 
who, who's institutionalized today, and, and, and it breaks my heart. And, and I'm, I'm a hard no vote on this because they just, we cannot do it to our youth. So that, that's where I stand. Yeah, I don't want to repeat a lot of the stuff that Marty said, um, but I do want to thank everybody that did take the time to speak and come down and, and spend time here tonight with us. We're usually pretty lonely down here. Um, but that being said, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things. There's a lot of reasons that you would want it. I don't smoke. Um, I don't need to. Um, it's not what I want. I realize it is some things that, that our citizens do want. I realize that it's... It, because of the regulation of it, it is safer. If, if I was in the state legislature, I probably wouldn't have voted for it. That would not have been my decision that I would want, but that is what is in front of us right now, is whether we have it or not. Um, if it's in North Aurora and it's in St. Charles, and we're kind of at the crossroads of it, people are going to be driving you know, past us as they've bought it, maybe used it, and, and it's happening now, it was happening before. So the only way that I support it is in if those tax dollars are earmarked that they go to public safety, period. Nothing else. Not to build bridges, not to put sidewalks in, not to do any of that. It's for public safety, period. That's the only way I support it um, because that's the impact we're going to have regardless. Um, I'm not here to make a decision tonight where I want them. That I would want if we have some sort of agreement. Do we think we have enough votes that I would want? I want information from the police saying, hey, go talk to those communities. What would they do differently? What problems have they had? Uh, what are the ordinances that they put in? What are the taxes they put in? What would they do differently? Because people have set that forward, and there's plenty of communities around uh, Illinois that have, have done this already, so let's find out what their issues are and what they would change. Um, but that's the only way I support it. It's, um, I guess another reason is you look at um, people do have medical licenses for it. Um, I know people that have them and they need them. Not everybody can get that. Um, not every doctor will sign off on that saying, yep, here you go, you can get it uh, medically. So that leaves those people to be in the situation where it's like, okay, I know it's beneficial. And um, Alderman Chanzit mentioned it when he was in Toronto, that they had specific things about that. Oh, you have... <laughs> arthritis take this this is the amount you want to take and they educate you on it it's not just somebody handing you a paper bag saying there you go that's go and, and do whatever you want it's it's a little bit more controlled than that um, yeah I mean I'm not necessarily a, a favor of of the drug in in general but I understand the benefits for it for some people and again only if those uh, funds are earmarked just mentioned um, just to tag on to the concerns that you mentioned and that the money would be earmarked for law enforcement I think that's something that um, the council should take into consideration in making the decision is that the public safety concerns um, with regard to <coughs> things like the the theft of the cash that is stolen on site that increases when you make the decision to actually have the dispensary here versus the costs of merely addressing the issues that Batavians are using um, cannabis. So just something kind of relevant to mm -hmm. keep in mind. Um, yeah, I, I'm a no and there's several th arguments or, or points that keep coming up and and one is that it's it's here it's legal um, but what I recently learned um, gambling's here and legal too and we and that was my mindset going into that and I approved it because of that um, and adults can do what they want and now I'm sorry I did it um, and when we approve it there's no turning back so we can say no and, and see the, the benefits down the line, uh, the revenue that's potential. We can see the cost, what they really are versus what we think they are. And we could always add it later, but once you add it, you can't take it back. So uh, I would push for some, some patience in that because just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right um, 
for my conscience and right for the town. And I've learned that uh, here. The, um, the other thing that comes up a lot, you, you just said um, the people that don't, because I would support uh, medicinal um, shops, but along those lines when you say, well, the, the people that self-subscribe, especially with alcohol and other drugs, that's where the real problem comes. So I, I wouldn't use that as an argument to say, let's do this so people can use this medicinally if they can't get them a, a prescription, if that makes sense. Um, the cost, we don't know what it really is um, for the police department is one, but remember this town and the brand we have in the schools, right? The mayor's always talking, the number one reason people come here and move here is because of the schools. Who is it? That's families. Families are coming here. And, you know, what's our brand going to be and, and the cost of that? You know, people moving here, people moving out, um, our reputation, the community as a whole, there, there's a cost to that. It's hard to put dollars on it, but I don't know it. So I'm not going to say it's, it's X and it's more than the revenues. I'm not going to say that, but we can wait. I, I know um, in my experience in, in investing and in, in having businesses, every time I've gotten into something because I thought I'm going to miss out if I don't jump in it, I've gotten murdered. Those are the worst things to do. So these, uh, we're, we're making a decision where we, we have conflicting information or not all the information, and it would at the very least be best to, to delay this. Um, hypocrisy comes up, and I, I've battled with this one <laughs> a lot, but I, I've I've dealt with it. I've I've overcome it. You'll be glad to know. <laughs> yeah. um, I I enjoy drinking, but I don't enjoy getting high or, or getting drunk. Um, it's part of my culture. It's part of my social life. I can I enjoy a glass of wine with dinner. It actually increases the pleasure of that, and I'm not getting drunk. Um, I cook with wine. The, the alcohol actually burns off. And if I didn't have Marsala wine, my chicken Marsala would be worthless. Um, so there's benefits to, to the alcohol. There, you know, um, Heineken, I see the ads now. You can get zero alcohol Heineken. I enjoy having a beer, um, going out after a meeting, having a beer. Uh, so I, I see that there, there's one reason to go into a pot shop. Um, alcohol, th there's the, the downsides could be worse, if not the same. I, I see that. It's just as bad, potentially. Um, but I've justified the hypocrisy <laughs> to a degree. But the, the main thing for me is, is uh, the message. We've, it's come up a lot with kids. I have three teenagers, um, and my decision it, it didn't... I, I thought it through, but... I'm going to go home and I'm not going to be naive and think that they're not exposed to it or have done it or anything like that. Um, but I'm going to let them know that I don't think it's okay and it's not what I want for our town. So um, that's my, my spiel. Dan? Thank you for addressing the hypocrisy. <laughs> Where was the outrage on item number eight for the class, class uh, K liquor license? We just granted blanket liquor licenses to, to our park district. Not one person got up and spoke about it. Not one person got up and spoke about it in committee when we even talked about the possibility of even issuing the license. In a town, and I've said this before, in a town where we have expanded video gambling, in a town where we have expanded liquor licenses to um, uh, theaters and, and gas stations and whatnot, we are, we are tremendous uh, hypocrites for, for saying uh, marijuana is, is different for, for some reason. Um, I want to go back. I, just, I wrote down all these notes here. But part of me wants to invite Lindsay back up here to, to talk about some of the fear mongering and some of the things that we heard tonight. A lot of the things we heard tonight, there was a lot of misinformation. Um, I'm going to let, I'm going to let it stand because we will be here literally all night. If we, if we go through and, and, and debate all those individual things. But that said, uh, New Year's Day, I went over to the pot shop in uh, North Aurora. It was like a four hour line. I could not get in. I just wanted to see it for myself. Remember, it was, what, 10 minutes for me to get into, into the one in Toronto because it had already been there for a long time. But I wanted to see what was going on in North Aurora. That four-hour line made them so I couldn't even get there. 
A buddy of mine brought over a package that he did purchase there today so I could take a look at it. I was fascinated. Uh, and Marty, to your point, the percentage of the THC was clearly listed on there. He knew exactly what he bought. It was sealed. He knew exactly what he was smoking. He knew exactly what he, what he purchased. Every other bag I've seen him with, he had no idea what was in it. So you didn't know how high he was going to get one particular night or whether it was going to be that chatty high or whether I needed to cook something for him kind of high. He at least knew what he was buying when he showed me this this package today. It was called Dragon's Breath. It smelled, it was really pungent as well, too. So I'd open my windows because my mom was coming over. Um, he bought this package. He said he would have bought it in Batavia if we would have had a dispensary here. He came home to Batavia to smoke it here in Batavia. We left money on the table with this guy. I'm not saying that that's the only reason that you'd want to do something like this, but we're fooling ourselves if we say that it's not here. It's here. Um, I anticipate there will be an uptick in, in resources. Um, to leave that money on the, on, on the table just makes absolutely no, uh, absolutely no, no, no sense to me whatsoever. Um, I would also support um, money towards public safety. Um, public education campaigns certainly wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to help uh, uh, finance uh, officers uh, in the high school and the middle school. If we can make any contribution to that whatsoever, I, I think that that's, those are all steps in the right direction. We decided to take a pause because we wanted to see what the other communities were doing. We don't need to approve this tonight. We really don't. Um, I think to, to one gentleman's point, though, it's not a matter of, of if but when. I do believe that there will come a day where it will be sold in the city of Batavia. Um, it, the fact that we're going to be facing the problems with it being here anyways, I, I can't imagine why we would wait tremendously long. My last point is this, is uh, in 10 years, almost 10 years on the council, the mayor has never threatened to veto a thing, uh, at least not that I can remember. In 10 years of covering him, I can't remember him threatening to veto a thing. And it, it is a big deal that we we're even discussing overriding his veto. He feels very strongly about this, and, and I do appreciate um, the political capital that he, he has spent on this. I said that night when he threw that gauntlet down that I would hope that there would be an ordinance that the 14 of us could craft that the mayor would, would sign. And he immediately said, I'm not playing games here. So it's on us. We, we, do need, we do need to come together if we're going to do this. But again, I've said the strongest things that we do here are 12 to 2s or 14 to zeros. I would really like to see as many of us on board as possible if we're going to, to move forward with, uh, with something here. So that's my remarks. Thank you. Elliot? Yeah, it, you know, a couple of things that have been said around here that I'm, I don't know, in my head I'm just finding hilarious and, and in a ways not in a good type of humor. Um, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree with what Lindsay had said. It's here. We've been dealing with it for a while. Um, I, I, I know there's only so much that can be spoken about those incidents and what happens with those incidents, um, but they're in our town. We're, we're naive to think that they aren't. Um, and, and I, of course, you know, my own fear is going to be that, you know, now that the state has made the decision to legalize marijuana to that capacity, having it for sale in two very nearby towns, you know, it is going to be more prevalent. Yes. People will know at least by the packaging what it is. Um, but it will be more prevalent. It won't be hidden quite as well. I, I suspect, I don't know that for sure. Um, so I do worry about how we're going to deal with that. It's, it's already here. We already have to deal with it. But it will be more prevalent, and we'll have to deal with that, too. And I do appreciate the, the notion of the, the hypocrisy topic. Um, but I also have, have kind of the same mentality of, of, what, I, of what I've also heard here. Um, I've been wrestling a lot with this one in that... Um, much like the gambling one, right? The video gaming. I've said numerous times, if I were on the council one month earlier, that would have been an additional no vote. And I've, I have absolutely been opposed to the expansion of that video gaming. I don't think it's good for our town. I don't think it is as beneficial as people want to see it. Um, and, and for those same reasons, I still wrestle with this one as well. The 3% tax 
that we could impose on this. It's something. I'm not going to scoff at 3% of a tax of anything. That's something. But is that what we want? Is that what we, is that what we need? I'm not denying that we need to find revenue. We need to find ways of raising revenue to pay for the things that keep our quality of life good. And certainly, we've struggled trying to find alternative sources of revenue. This past budget season got heated. It did. But I also have five kids. I've got five kids in three different levels of schooling. Elementary, middle, high school. And I've heard the stories of the bathrooms. I know we have an officer in there. Very few of those kids are 18 years of age or older purchasing tobacco products. Now 21. They're still vaping. They're still in that school vaping. And it's illegal. So even if the state of Illinois has legalized marijuana for over the age of 21, it's still going to happen under 21. It's just going to be more prevalent. I don't want my name on that. So I'm leaning no. Next. Mike? Yeah. I'm for this. I want to be able to provide cannabis in a safe, efficient manner for those that do buy it. Uh, we did put the pause on this a few months back. Uh, and now that we're into January and there's already a, a few cannabis places that are open selling it, I believe the state is only offering 47 licenses from January to May. I have no doubt in my mind that those applications are already made. So I think we wouldn't even be dealing with this or anybody coming to our community till 2021, which we're going to have more than ample time to analyze this even further. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in now. I, Mike makes a very good point that all said and done, no matter what we decide to do, even if we do approve this, the chances of us getting a dispenser here, even for medical right now, are, to me, very, very slim. I think we have a better chance of getting uh, any of the production facilities before we would ever get a dispensary. Um, just because I think that the supply side has already seen such a hit that they need to ramp up production in this state. I mean, I think that's that's going to be the big thing I think that's going to change this year. Um, I, I, too, struggled with this because I think of how, um, you know, we went back and forth for several years trying to see if we were going to add another officer to handle some of the issues that we've had, the, the heroin problems that we have in this community, and being able to deal with that on a, a better level um, requires funding. And you know this could create a source of funding for possibly part of an officer, you know, or a part-time officer. So I, I think that's something that we just can't ignore in the grand scheme of what's in our community or what's going to be in our community and the issues that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, that being said, it's everybody's personal choice. And, you know, I know people that have smoked pot since I was in high school and run successful businesses and lead very fulfilling lives. And then I also know other people that kind of destroy their lives. But I can also tell you that tenfold to that is the lives I've seen destroyed by alcohol. Um, it's just, it's got to, at some level, be on personal responsibility. And, you know, it is in our community. It has been approved by our state, and it is legal. Um, whether you believe that or like that or agree with that, that's, again, your own personal choice. Um, going to video gambling, I would love for anybody sitting at this table to tell me what places do and don't have video gaming machines in their businesses because most of the ones that I know of and where they're at, you don't even know them when you walk in the door. You'd have to ask where they are. And I don't think that the majority of people that I'm aware of that I have asked about it 
make their decisions on going to those businesses whether or not they have gaming machines. Um, the same thing being said, you know, I'm not in the realty world, but I can't imagine that that's the first thing out of somebody's mind is, do they sell pot in that town or not? The first thing we want to know is what are the scores are at the schools, what kind of team that they have, if their kids are in, interested in sports, do they have a great band? Those are the kind of questions people ask. I don't think whether or not they sell pot is in the top five questions that get asked of a realtor when they go in to look for a house. Um, they do realize that Illinois has recreational marijuana available, so I'm not afraid of it. And I think that the fear that's out there about this, it's not going to ruin Batavia. It's not going to ruin Illinois. Springfield might ruin Illinois, <laughs> but marijuana is not going to ruin the state. It's not going to ruin the city. So from the fear standpoint, I just discount that. And I think we have to take an approach where, given the ability we have to control what's out there, we should take that. And we should take the availability of the tax dollars that are available. I don't have any problem with going right to the max at 3%. And I agree with the other one, people that have said it has to go to public safety. Yeah. The state didn't say anything about what they're doing with the money. It's going in the general fund. It's not paying down the pension debt. It's not doing anything else. It's going into the general fund, which I think was the biggest mistake that the state made when they allowed recreational marijuana. They should have earmarked some of that money to go to some of the big problems that we have in the state, not just throw it into the general fund. Um, yeah, I just want to throw out about the uh, not being afraid. Um, I'm also, I talked with Dan about this one, I am not afraid about putting this out to a public vote. The reason for that, the reason for that is Illinois was the first state to legalize marijuana by legislative fiat. It wasn't a vote of the people. Now people knew that the governor was probably going to do that, so they didn't have the say. And if you look in what we're really concerned about, we're trying to figure out, we know that our hands were tied by what the law is. So we are trying to, with all good heart and intentions, trying to figure out the best way to protect the people. And I believe that the best way is if it's going to be sold in the community, that it be packaged, it be regulated, people know what they're buying, and so on and so forth. But I'm also not afraid that if the community decides to vote for it, then you have the backing to say, well, this is why we're doing it. I'm That I have zero problem with. And knowing what we know, we passed the uh, medical marijuana uh, in 2016, for those, we, we've had no bites. So the concern that tomorrow, whether we voted for something, that all of a sudden every street corner is going to be filled with marijuana shops, it's not going to happen. We haven't even been approached by any marijuana medical entities. So with the fact that just like I know my neighbor, your honor, has said with the law, yes, it's going to be in areas where there is uh, the social justice aspect of it first. It's not coming here first. So with those things in mind, do we want to do it? I, I, I don't mind so substituting the collective judgment for that on this issue. I, don't, I really don't have a problem with that. I, I was counting three so far. I have Mike. Elliot and Nick as no so far. I didn't count any other ones. I don't want to waste a minute of staff's time or government service committee's time if we don't have a solid uh, 10 to override the mayor's veto. I, it doesn't sound like there's an appetite to do this right now, at least as far as dispensaries are concerned. There's, well, right, we can, there, there, there's, there's several other people <laughs> right. that have this. Well, we're, we're already, we already can't right. do it. We already can't do it. No, we only have three. You need have five to say no. The same. Tony? Yep. Um, yeah, I, uh, 
You know, the, the likelihood of, of a dispensary coming uh, to Batavia in the near future is, is quite slim. I think there was, there's currently 40 medical dispensaries that were given licenses to sell recreational uh, the first of the year, and then there's 75 uh, licenses that will be uh, awarded by May 2nd, I think. Uh, the deadline for those has already passed. Uh, so the likelihood, um, I think they could still, once they get the license, they could select a, a location different than what they may have proposed. Um, but uh, so the, the money, um, the piece, you know, the likelihood of getting that and getting some revenue off of, off of this um, uh, in terms of dispensaries, I, I, I don't see that as a substantial reason to, to support it. Uh, there is the possibility of, of revenue from a grower coming here and using up a whole bunch of our power that we seem to need to sell. But uh, that's, that's another discussion and the likelihood of a grower where there's no dispensary because some of the growers will, could have license to free dispensary also uh, could limit us from significant revenue in the future. But to me, the revenue piece is, is uh, that's not why I'm uh, supportive of this law of the uh, uh, the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act that the, the General Assembly has passed. It is truly about social justice, as the judge said. Um, they, in fact, Article 7 is uh, social equity in the cannabis industry. Um, and there is some money, uh, revenue earmarked from that uh, to address that social inequity. And the social inequities that have existed is because we have gotten drug laws so wrong in this country for so long. There are, and, and let's talk about children, because there have been children suffering for years that live in communities not so far from here, less affluent communities, communities of color, where families have been destroyed because their parents have been incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. Let's talk about the children in America that have been affected and what, is, what needs to be done to do the right thing to make a wrong a right? Uh, it was brought up about the border. Yes, that is a huge problem. I say let's take a cash cow away from the cartels who have been slaughtering people and destroying children and, and families uh, along the border. That's the social justice I'm interested in. I'm interested in getting right what has been wrong for so many years where people have been this, you know, uh, families have been destroyed. I mean, right close to here, communities not far from here, incarcerated people for nonviolent drug offenses. Think of the expenses. I said the same thing uh, about social justice uh, back in the fall when I addressed this. Um, I think we're missing the boat if we don't uh, realize what this legislation is really about. It's about doing things to right some wrongs that have existed in our country in our state, and yes, Illinois was the first state to do that, uh, to do it without a referendum. Um, I, I applaud the, the leaders of the state for realizing that we have a big problem. We incarcerate more than China and Japan, or China and Russia combined. And a big reason for that is nonviolent drug offenses. And so for Batavia to just say, we don't want any part of that, I'm sorry. I think Batavia is the kind of town that says, let's be part of the solution. Um, I think. You know, I, I don't think there's going to be a dispensary uh, or someone knocking on our door to do it. But uh, to, to say that, uh, you know, this law is, is immoral or this is wrong, I think you, you're getting it wrong because this is a move in the right direction uh, to pass this law. And I think Batavia, should, we should keep it in our, in our thoughts of how we can be part of a solution. So that's what, those are my thoughts on that. You want to say something, Drew? Uh, sure, <laughs> I, will, I, I will chime in. I'm, I'm inclined. I'm going to support this. Um, I think that the point was brought up. Uh, has been brought up several times that it's the issue isn't whether marijuana should be legal or not. A lot of the arguments I heard were whether it should be legal or not, and that's a state issue, and that's already been decided for us. So now it's up to us to decide what we want to do with it and deal with what in effect is the unfunded mandate of the state legalizing it, which means we will have potentially issues to deal with. Um, and if we don't, you know, if we stick our heads in the sand and pretend like it's legal everywhere else and if we don't have a dispensary here, there's going to be no pot in town. That's 
not realistic. So I think the responsible thing for us to do is to understand it, deal with it on our own terms, set our own uh, ideas for where and how and to who, you know, with, within the law, and uh, to set ourselves up to potentially take advantage of some of the some tax revenue that, if we're in the position of having somebody actually want to bring a license to town that can help us offset some of that unfunded mandate that came with the state saying, yes, it's legal, you you got to deal with it. So I'm going to support this. Okay. Joe? You know, I've, I've struggled with this issue since it first came up, and I have been solidly on the fence <laughs> listening to arguments from both sides. And from time to time, I'm leaning either way on that fence because I'm struggling with it so much. I appreciate the passion of everybody that came out tonight and know that we were up here listening intently and no decision was made by this council before we came in here tonight. And I can tell you, it's solid on the fence. There was one gentleman that spoke and he was one of the last ones that spoke. Earlier today, a conversation I had with one of my uh, compatriots up here was the cost offset, not the tax revenue that the, the sales tax would give us, but the cost offset of the law enforcement and first responder e expenses that the city is going to face because of what the state has done to us. That made sense to me. That leaned me one way until I heard some more voices. Because that to me said, boy, if we can use that money and not raise property taxes, we've not raised property taxes. That's a good thing. That's what I've been about. That was my point during some of our spirited debates with the budget. What can we do to not raise property taxes? Until I hear somebody say, you know what? If you have to raise my property taxes to keep the sales out of my town, I'm for it. That, sway, that changed where I am and got me off the fence and I cannot support a recreational shop in, Mer in Batavia. Abby, just call the rest of you out. <laughs> um, to re reiterate, I don't remember who said it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of this passing. I'm not afraid of, I'm not, I'm not worried about any major changes to our town as a result of passing or allowing dispensaries because I don't think that much is going to change. I don't think that um, the rates of usage are going to skyrocket. I don't think they're going to rise. If they do rise, it's probably going to see a decrease in liquor sales. Um, of, my, of my friends that live in states where it's already legal, um, that's what they have done. You know, they, they, they run marathons and they have kids and they get up early for their jobs and they don't want to be hung over, but they want to have a glass of wine or two with dinner and they want, you know, they get home from a stressful day. And again, no judgment to them. If they want to take the edge off, they have replaced alcohol with marijuana and to no difference to their lives otherwise. Um, and I don't, I think the people that are doing it in this town, and there are a lot of people doing it in this town, are going to continue to do it, and, um, and maybe a few more will join. Um, it's already in our schools. That's an issue we have to deal with, with or without this law. Um, I'm just not worried. Like, this has just never, this has never worried me much. Um, and... So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm for it. Keenan? I, um, I would also be for this. Um, <clears throat> I've had many discussions with my wife about this. I've had discussion with my own pastor because I wanted to know how I would be with this. Um, I've also had, also almost lost a brother-in-law to drugs, um, seeing my my wife and thinking how I was going to tell my kids we lost an uncle. Um, 
he he went subsequently he was revived went back to went to jail uh, for a couple of years. We have um, um, he is getting his life together, and I I've, I've had discussions with this about him as well. And I just I'd um, I I we've come to the we've we've had discussions. Um, my mother was a health teacher. She's had discussions with me when I was young, when I was um, in high in college. Even now, I talk to her probably a couple times a day just to say what's going on. I've had discussions with her about it. My sister, a lot of people in town, people that are for it, people that are against it. Um, I just, I am also not afraid of, of what can change. And I've not been here more than five years. Um, I love this town. We moved here because we love this town. Um, I know it's, it's always going to be around. It's been around. But it is, it is something that I think is not going to change this town in a way that I think a lot of people think it will. So I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Well, newbie, it's your turn. And welcome to the council. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank everybody that came up and spoke this evening, shared your stories, shared um, all the information that you had and researched. Um, this is definitely um, a matter um, that's very difficult obviously from all the other council members um, that have shared their experience. Um, I am in the belief that we have to set our community up um, for the potential of the future. Um, and some of that includes the possibility of how we are going to deal with the law that has been um, made in the state. The state has made this legal um, and so we have to deal with the consequences. Um, marijuana was used before this law was in effect. Marijuana is going to be used now that this law is in effect. The thing that scares me the most about marijuana is where people, what they're ingesting. Prior to the regu regulation um, by the state, they would go and get marijuana that was traced with all sorts of other things. And that is what was sending people to the hospital and getting sick. Um, our law enforcement is going to have to deal um, if we don't have a dispensary in, in the community, and, and we're not going to get one right away. Um, they're going to have to deal with, um, they still have to deal with it. And we have to be able to support them um, and I really feel that if we do agree to a dispensary, um, which I w do support, um, that we do earmark the um, funds to public safety. Thank you. I, I kind of want to congratulate everybody in this room, both out in the audience and up here. This is probably the first time since I've been on the council where we've gone through a discussion or debate like this and we've got everybody to to put out their position and their reasons why and I really feel like that's a win for all of us and for this community that we've gone through and done this and it's not an easy decision and it takes a lot for any one of us up here and anybody out there that came up to the mic tonight or even just showed up to be here um, to get to this point so I think that this is a win for the community, regardless of which side you're on, regardless of what your views are, where this is going to go. Um, I think it, it's a success that we've got to this point. Um, I guess at this point, I probably would uh, entertain a motion. I don't want to do a motion. Or, I just wanted to or, give a suggestion. Or, or, as, okay. Well, obviously, it's, this is just a discussion, so mm -hmm. it would be a uh, direction with right, any direction to staff. Um, to Dan's point before, I don't know that this is one of those that is like you feel strongly about this because it's, I mean, it's 10, but I don't know. It's, and there's even some, there's been some wavering in that. And Marty, you're not afraid of a, 
a vote. Mm-hmm. I'm not afraid of a vote either, and I don't know if we continue this discussion another time to say, do we just put this out there as a referendum at some point? I can't remember, Laura, how far in advance. So we would have missed the um, the cutoff for the March ballot, but I believe that there is still time for it to be put on the November ballot. That's where I would suggest. I don't have, I would even want to see this in doing what, I feel the state didn't do was hash out a lot of the discussions and figure out what you're going to do, what the intended consequences are, and so on and so forth. I don't have a problem with advancing it forward to because, as we know, nothing would happen tomorrow anyways. It would have to go through zoning and planning. It would have to go through more uh, city council and committee meetings before we would even come with a concept of where it's going to go, what times it's going to go, how it's going to be. So all of those things would be good to have discussions on in the months preceding, and I don't care, put it on the November ballot so that at least the community will know, well, what is out there? Where's it going to go? And then they can make informed decisions on that stuff. Uh, say yay or nay, because from the, the amount of people that I have talked to, I know from talking to people and what I have heard, I believe the majority are in favor of having a dispensary from based on what I have heard and I have reached out among lots of people. I know there are people that are against it, but I know the amount that are for, and I know the amount that are for that will privately have conversations that you wouldn't think. So it's kind of like a lot of, um, a lot of votes that they may say something publicly, but privately they will say another thing. And I weigh that stuff, and I weigh that stuff with all of the other issues and the conscience part of it that we do have. So that's why I would be in favor of advancing it to get through the, figure out where we would put it and go through all of those discussions, because we haven't had any of those discussions, the one, and vote. The one thing that I think we have to keep in mind here is this is just from the history of this community before I was on the council. Mm. Um, when you think about sending this to referendum, it can't be, okay, we have four choices for what we would pass as a referendum like we did try to do with a bridge. It needs to be this is the ordinance that the city council has crafted, and this is what we would say. Here's X number of places it could be. This is the locations. This is the hours. All that would have to be there if we're going to put this to a referendum so that way what goes out to the public would be what the reality would be if it were to pass because if there's any other questions in there then it gets too muddled and it'll never it'll never make sense to enough people to go one way or the other that really is reflective of what the community would be okay with that's and that was that's my point right, about right, it, that it all so has that to get done and all of that means then you have community buy-in there's no questions about mm -hmm. who does and who doesn't support it as as we saw from the home rule referendum i trust my neighbors to make mm -hmm. the decision that yep. was clearly overwhelmingly at presidential levels and i was never concerned about that going into it because i knew what the community would vote for mm -hmm based on listening to neighbors. I have that same concept now, and if we craft legislation that allays concerns, puts in safeguards, puts those things that we're all concerned about with increased crime going up, parking, uh, traffic, all of those concerns can be addressed, so people are making why I initially really want this to begin with. It's about making informed decisions as adults. That's the responsible thing to do. Joe? So what then is the timeline for getting all of that written, approved through all the processes it needs to go through in time to get it on the November ballot? That's now the time crunch we have in which to work and hash this out. That can be well, done. That's, well, that's, we don't have well, to have it on the November it, ballot. If, it, if it's going to be on the November ballot, we now have a fixed amount of time to, along with everything else that goes on in the city, to put that together in a way that it's cohesive and makes sense and is what you're looking for. Which we would have to go through anyways because if it passed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not afraid of a vote. I, I've said my position. I'm not afraid to lose a vote. I've lost some before. Mm -hmm. um,
that said, I do think that by going through that process, we would get to a better place that at least has hashed out, no pun intended, many more of the details <laughs> about what this might look like if a dispensary were ever even a license granted to the city of Batavia. And I absolutely agree that even if this thing were to be on the next council session and were to pass through in a supermajority to override the mayor's veto, we are not getting a dispensary day one afterwards. <laughs> so I would support a referendum if that's what it came to. Dan? So what happens after we get a vote? Do the no's change to yeses? More importantly, does the mayor now, out more importantly, does the mayor now ignore the will of the people? If the people of the town say they want a dispensary, we've now just set up our mayor to have to veto it. I don't um, I don't I, I, I would I would well, no, say that when there we are send two him, types of referendum. Is it advisory so or non advisory? Advisory or there binding, is a binding, binding right. referendum. A binding referendum would mm -hmm. mean there's no action on the base of anyone on council to undo that. So we would be heading in the binding referendum. That is what Let people have their say. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Uh, put it put it put it the it's other way. Very important if it's advisory and then it gets overturned by the council, how does that go down? Right. It should be binding. So it, it should be binding. It needs to be binding. It needs to be binding. That's I mean, what I'm saying. It, November is an attractive time to do it because it should be a pretty big turnout. Turn I heard turnout Agree. would be big. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just guessing. <laughs> I have heard. Might be a big town. I ain't heard it. That, that's what I'm saying. I just don't, I don't want any unintended consequences. I don't want there to be any con confusion here. Uh, well, and, and my point with it, I don't want there to be any doubt between all of our neighbors that we're not all concerned about what this means for us. Something that was legislated in Springfield, we didn't have a say in. And we all have the same goals in common, which is figure out what's the best for our community. More people involved in the conversation is never a bad thing. Sure. No. I think you're um, right there by putting together, you know, the where, you know, putting together the details. Because I think some of the people that are against it, they're feel fearful. They're fearful that we're going to put it right down Wilson Street, right in the middle. That's going to say pot shop, which would change the image. So I think, you know, really having um, everything out there so people understand they may change their mind a little bit or you know have a better idea of what we're trying to frame for the future mike yeah and i have no problem on putting this on a referendum as well but i would also like to get in front of this we knew that this was coming the governor now campaigned on it and he he won so it's out there we knew it was coming i'd rather get ahead of the curve than behind it and be ready if we do get something. So I think we should at least craft something. If we have it on a November ballot, we have it on a November ballot. Mr. Mayor, what do you think? I, mean, I think the will of the people speaks for itself. I mean, I, I would certainly not want, think it would be a wise idea to do an advisory referendum one way or the other. I think you're going to put it out there and let the people truly make up their mind what they want to do. I certainly would not, you know, if you voted 10 to 4, I'd still vote, vote, uh, veto it, and you'd have to vote on it a second time. So it would be one of those legacy votes, I'm told, that you create when you go to a veto, and then it's the vote that sticks with everybody for the rest of their, probably goes on your obituary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as, I, as I told you at the very beginning when this whole conversation started, I took the position I did because I've had some very, very sad and dark moments in my years as mayor of this town with some of the families of, of kids that have been lost to drugs. And it's one of the saddest things you ever wanted to deal with. And it's hugging and holding hands and all this second guessing about, geez, didn't it know. And I, several times I've heard it all started with uh, marijuana and that was a great way that got me into this mess that we're into. I mean, as recent as last week, and I'll leave it at this, Chief Ewell and I had a conversation with one of the parents of one of the victims in Batavia. And there's some other things going on about it now after the fact, but uh, it's just a very, very sad situation to every time have to deal with this. And because of having lived that experience and seeing the utter dismay and disparity and, 
and tragedy that's been created by this, I cannot in good conscience put my name on anything that legalizes drugs in the city of Batavia. Just that's the end of the story. I'm not going to sign anything that will do that. I mean, if the people vote to go ahead and do it, then that's, that's the decision and that goes forward. But as long as, you know, I'm the mayor through May of 2021, so uh, that's where it will be, at least to that date, and then we'll see where the community wants to go. But I would suggest that, you know, you, you I commend your idea here of trying to let people make the decision because I think there's a lot of people, some in this audience, who get pretty fired up, and you have an interesting conversation and campaign, both pro and con, going on in this town, probably the likes of which you've never have seen before. One of the things um, I have learned about referendums is that it's important that the question that you ask is very clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I commend you for wanting to include as much information as possible so that a person who is voting yes to that question has as much understanding of what that's going to look like for the city of Batavia. But I think we also need to balance that with keeping the question very simple. Because from what I have heard of the people's opinions tonight and those that have been um, via email and the last discussion we had in August, it seems like there are two camps. There is one camp that does not want to see one recreational dispensary in the city of Batavia ever. And then the other camp, I think, would allow you in the best interests of the city uh, residents, if there's, they're already in the camp of dispensaries are okay, and they may just trust you to determine um, what the parameters of that should be. But, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think the simple question, should the city of Batavia allow a, a recreational dispensary to be located in this city? might be the better route. But I'd like to get Kevin Drendel's opinion on how to craft that question yeah, as because well. It's simple. Simple. And that's something Keep that it I simple. think that legal has to answer for us because I think it's almost we have to have an ordinance that's out there that if the referendum passes, that's what would pass, mm -hmm. would be the ordinance. Mm -hmm. And yeah. does that mean that we approve one ahead of time and we have 10 that would approve it, and if it passes, then it's done? Or, or how we would do that. So I'm, that's a Maybe question it's we, conditional. Have to have, we have to have. Or you could go the other route and you could, we could approve it and put the question to the, shall it be rescinded? Was the same and and that's something you. where I think. Then you require people to do additional research before they get to the ballot box. Yeah, yeah. So they'll see should ordinance no, this, exactly this, allowing the recreational dispensary well, they have to go do more research before they can answer the question. Or we pass it with the 10 votes that we have, and if the public doesn't like it, they just unseat all of us. Or there's... That's there's, the other reality. I mean, that's, what school, that's what's happened at the school board level. If we're only at 10, I'm, I'm not on board. If we're exactly on the line. Yeah, that's what that's I figured. That's why I brought this I, I'm peeling off if, yeah. we're only at, if we're only at 10. So the other, the other thing you can do is also enact, or enact with... The caveat to be enacted upon November fifth, depending on the election. I mean, right. and mm -hmm. you you you, you, you take the book off the shelf if needed. If you right. don't need it, it's never enacted. Right. And that way, you're prepared. Everybody can kind of follow along. But the core question is, yay or nay, to a marijuana dispensary. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter on how many hours or this or that. You don't have to put that in the question. But if you've properly prepared and educated and had conversations knowing why they were doing something or what we would what it would look like, yeah. it's not a vague concept. Where the funds would go. Well, and where the that funds that would go. would then put into play the public hearings and stuff that I would have to go through to get the things through community development that would have to be enacted to change that. And I think that's something that we shouldn't put our staff through until we know yes or no. Right. I mean, we talked about this last year when we discussed this, that we weren't going to force our staff to go through everything that would be needed to get to that point unless we knew we had the votes to pass it. And if we're, you know, looking at doing it through referendum, then I think that's where we have to start it from. It, you know, and then if that means we're a year behind on whatever the benefits would be to us, 
So we're not getting tanks. one anyways. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And whether or not we ever get one. I, again, I think we'd be much better served in the community if we went after the, the grow facilities and the processing facilities. So we have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we try to get it on the November election, we have Kevin draft up something, a simple question that's a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. And just keep it simple. Yes. Are we separating the issues then? What? Just, just in general, um, because the hang-up seems to be in dispensaries. Are, are, are we cool with someone using all our power and wanting to do a cultivation center if they the apply tomorrow? Center. It already exists. It already exists. Already allowed. That already exists. Correct. It already exists. It doesn't matter whether it's recreational or medical. Because we made the change because, in the terms. Because now the state law I missed, has I missed that all that was done when we oh. changed earlier. That already exists. Anybody wants to grow any, build a grow facility, they can. It's already and allowed. That's just because we updated business. our definitions previously. Well, and so we yeah. didn't need to because we already did that when we did the medical. Because we did that already. Right, <laughs> Personally, right. I think that's the bigger opportunity for us, right? Because yeah. one of the things that was in the state law that, I don't know if it was when it was revised or when it was originally put out is any of the recreational facilities, they can only buy 40% of their supply from one place. And there's not enough places growing it right. for the demand that's out there today. So places are having to shut down because they won't break the law right. to buy more than 40% from one place. So if anything, we're more likely to see that kind of application. That, that I think, Absolutely. is going to be the bigger growth opportunity than the dispensaries. Especially the craft grower, the 5,000 square feet and less. I think you're going to see a huge proliferation of those, just like craft brewing. Yeah. And then we can sell our electricity. Our reliable electricity. <laughs> oh, reliable. Redundant. And heavily supported. <laughs> With access to two interstates. And just to make clear, um, sometimes in the discussion, it seemed like, um, I just want to make clear, our code does allow medical dispensaries. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. are a conditional use. Yes. So they're not a, a automatically allowed. Right. They have to go through the conditional mm -hmm. use process. And we don't have any of those at this point. So we haven't had anybody knocking down our doors. For years. Yep, going on four years now. Okay. Well, I think that ends our discussion on that. And we I would like to thank everybody that's giving came down. direction. So do you have clear direction from us? Yes, I do. More than two of us have said move forward with that, find out the legal questions that we would have to do right. to get it on the ballot in November. Mm -hmm. And we'll figure out how to get from today to there so that we have a, a good question crafted to be on the ballot and I'll say contingency plan for where we go if that passes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Scott, did you have any additional questions? No, I, 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 think, that, I think that clarifies it. I think it, you, you cross that main question and then if, it, if it's positive, then we have more discussion about you know where, when, and how, and all that good stuff. Right. I mean that's that's the next step because that has to go through the zoning code and amendments to the zoning ordinance and everything else to do that. All right. But well, we can we can have the discussion to prepare for that. Yes. Doesn't have to involve staff preparing anything. Correct. Just the fourteen of us just talking about. It's not tonight. Right. Setting up. <laughs> <laughs> you can come down tomorrow. Right. It's only ten thirty. Let's just do the framework oh, tonight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make a motion? <laughs> project status. Okay. We'll move right on to project status. <laughs> Item number 20. I really do have a couple of okay. important things to share. Um, so <clears throat> one of those has to do with um, Kane County Department of Tran Division of Transportation invited us to a stakeholders meeting today to discuss improvements at Fabian Parkway in 31. They've actually created a public website. It's called uh, fabian31intersection.com. I will um, send that out. We'll also be doing social media posts. It'll be in our weekly update with that address. And that is a website where KDOT will keep everyone informed of the progress of this. So they are in the feasibility study phase of this right now. Um, and then they expect to, um, as early as September of this year, come back with a preferred solution at that intersection and hold public meetings for comments as well. But if anybody has any questions about that, there are emails available at that site for people to submit both their opinions and then also um, any questions that they might have. 
The other thing uh, that I just wanted to let you know was today I attended the um, Fox Valley branch of the American Public Works Association annual meeting. And at that meeting, there were six regional projects that received awards in our wastewater treatment plant was one of those. And so uh, Trotter and Associates gave a very nice presentation to a room of about 200 people. And we look forward to bringing that award here at a future meeting um, so that we can all celebrate the accomplishment. It was pretty awesome to think about how many different constituencies had to come together in order for that project to be such a success. You know, you look at all of the different divisions of public works that were involved, but you know, there were IT issues. It was community development. It was the police department. It was the fire department. Um, Trotter and Associates was an amazing partner. And um, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the patience of our interfaith food pantry because their operations were severely disrupted by this project and they were just awesome about understanding that it was a, a huge improvement for the community and um, being willing to work with us and um, we tried to do everything that we could to be as minimally disruptive to their um, project as possible. Those were just a couple of important things that have happened that I despite the long meeting I wanted to share with you tonight. Yeah, thank you. Can I say something else? I went today at luncheon today. Yes, thank you, Mike, for attending. Tell you, our project was probably the most complex out of all the projects that were there, and I was proud to be a Batavian. Yeah, awesome. Anybody else? Move we adjourn? Any others? Yeah. I was just going to say really quickly to save an email, I won't be here next week. So. <laughs> yes, I will not be either. Okay. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for a good meeting. Yes.